uh, this uh, subcommittee on the Philippine Qualifications Framework is uh, now called to order. Uh, let me acknowledge the presence of our esteemed colleague, Senator Nancy Binay, who just uh, 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 went out, but uh, she will be back. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, everyone. I would like to uh, first and foremost uh, ask our committee secretary to acknowledge all the guests and the uh, resource persons uh, present here today and uh, indicate the respective offices and official designations uh, for the record, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, may we acknowledge the presence of Busek Gina Ogonong, Under Secretary for Curriculum and Teaching. Morning, ma'am. Asek Almatorio. Morning, ma'am. Assistant Secretary for Curriculum and Teaching. From the Department of Labor and Employment, Ms. Grace Baldosa, Division Chief Labor Market Information, BLE. From the Commission on Higher Education, Dr. Cherry Melanie Ancheta Jego. Morning, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ethel Agnes P. Valenzuela, Member Chair Technical Panel. Morning, po. From the Professional Regulation Commission, Dr. Jose Y. Cueto, Commissioner. Good morning. Dr. Melinda Garcia, Program Manager, Board of Dentistry. Good morning, Paul. From the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, we have Deputy Director General Rosana Ordaneta. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Paul. Uh, Director David Bogal Bongalion, Executive Director. Morning. Director Elcid Castillo, Executive Director. Morning, sir. From the Education Development Center Incorporated, we have Dr. Maria Teresa Muhammad. Good morning, ma'am. Mr. Angelic Ruz, Private Sector Advisor. Mr. Carlo P. Fernandez, Higher Education Lead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Comsec. Again, uh, let me uh, acknowledge and uh, thank our dear colleague, Senator Nancy Binay, who is uh, also here with us. And I will, uh, I will uh, uh, give way if she wanted to give an opening statement because... So I'm uh, giving the floor to Senator Nancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we can already proceed with the uh, meeting proper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sec, there's another one. Uh, yes, sir. We have Please. Dr. Carol Markey. Of course. Executive Director. Who is Carol Yee? Who is that? Our Executive Director, of course, is uh, here from the Education uh, Commission 2. Utusan po niya nako dahil ako isa sa mga commissioner po niya. Magsisimula po ako by uh, giving a very short uh, statement. Nagpapasalamat po ako sa bawat isa for uh, coming here today. And uh, I know that this is going to be a fruitful uh, morning considering our uh, topic. At the uh, outset, let me express my appreciation to the chairperson of the Committee on Higher Technical and Vocational Education, uh, Senator Chis Escudero. He used to be my minority leader. I was his uh, deputy minority leader when we were in the opposition. Uh, grupo ng mga talunan dahil lahat lagi kaming talo sa botohan. Uh, papasalamat tayo sa kanya for entrusting uh, to us the duty of uh, tackling important questions in the education sector today. Um, this morning, we will be discussing the uh, following bills and resolution. Senate Bill number 364, filed by this representation on the Lifelong uh, Learning Development Framework. Senate Bill number 2072 by Senator Jingo Estrada, also on the LLDF, and proposed Senate Resolution number 15 by Senator Win uh seeking an inquiry into the status of the implementation of the Philippine Qualifications Framework Act. Uh, para mabiliso, tatlong punto lang yung nais nating marating sa hearing na ito uh, from this representation. Ang una ay uh, nagawa po ba natin yung... Uh, 
pag-iimplementa ng Philippine Qualifications Framework Act. Mahigit limang taon na po ito na nakalipas mula nang naging batas ang Republic Act Number no. 10968 noong January 2018. Ngunit hindi po totoo na five years old lang ang Philippine Qualifications Framework natin dahil noong 2012, na-establish po ito sa pamamagitan ng isang executive order number 83 ni dating Pangulong Noy Noy Aquino. Ang pagsasabatas po natin ng PQF at hindi humadali magpasa ng batas dito sa Senado dahil talagang ini-scrutinize at uh, talagang pinag-uusapan, dinidiscuss thoroughly. Hindi ho ako nagpaparinig, dinidiscuss thoroughly. Kaya ho, hindi ho ganun kadali nung ipinasa natin itong 20, noong 2018 para ma-institutionalize at matiyak po natin ang tuloy-tuloy na gawain para po mas lalong mapaigting ang Philippine Qualifications Framework. If the number of meetings of the PQF NCC would serve as our metric of success, makikita na po natin agad kung bakit mabagal ang usad nito. Parang... Ayoko na sabihin yung sirang plaka dahil wala nang plaka pero I really sound like a broken record every single year, every budget deliberation. I would ask this question as to how many times are you meeting, what is going on with PQF, NCC, etc. But you know, we, we want to know how we can help at the uh, policy level and seek better ways to move forward at a faster uh, pace and uh, more efficient rate with the work entrusted to the PQF National Coordinating Council. Pangalawa, ang gusto ho nating mangyari ay kasi lagi po nating sinasabi sa na sa panahon po ngayon, importante na maging isang lifelong learner. Pero ano po ba talaga yung ibig sabihin ng lifelong learning? Saan po ba nagsisimula ang lifelong learning para po sa isang tao? We are sure that uh, this question is also being asked by uh, our uh, colleagues and uh, friends from Edcom 2. Does it only start after finishing uh, tertiary education? Or, ako, tinanong ako nung last time sa isang conference, is it limited to Tibet? Alam nyo, ang paniniwala ko, at uh, ito ay personal para sa akin, dapat basic education pa lang. Kasama ang alternative uh, learning system o ALS na pagtutuunan na natin ng pansin ang lifelong learning. Kaya nga po, foundation ng 8 level PQF natin ang basic education. So it's very important. Last but not the least, pangatlo, marami po sa atin ang may alam o may idea ukol sa lifelong learning. Formal, non-formal, at informal learning. Ngunit, paano po ba natin na uh, uh, magagamit yung mga ito para sa isang, uh, o para sa ating career progression? Ito naging topic namin matagal pinag-usapan doon sa Edcom 2 if uh, Dr. Carol uh, would recall. Um, kaya ho dito pumapasok yung kahalagahan ng alternative learning system, ladderized education, um, expanded tertiary education equivalency and accreditation program, yung Philippine Credit Transfer System, continuing professional development, mga special training programs, at iba pa na mga stackable, uh, yun yung word na pinamana sa akin ni DJ Irene, stackable qualifications na gusto nating mapalawak sa ilalim po ng tulong trabaho lo at iba pang mga batas. Ito po yung ilan lamang sa mga programa na gusto po nating malaman ang estado ngayong umaga, kaya baka pwedeng isama niyo sa inyong opening statement o presentation itong mga katanungan at mahalagang uh, binanggit natin dito uh, ngayong umaga. Hindi lamang po dahil gusto nating magkaroon ng uh, mas malinaw na hubog ang ating uh, sistema ng edukasyon, kundi ho para na din po makita ang kahalagahan ng pagiging isang lifelong learner. So we look forward to hearing uh, the insights of our guests, resource persons, even from the private sector. Uh, nandito po yung uh, USAID Opportunity 2.0 and International Labor Organization on uh, today's discussions. Uh, again, I am also eager to hear from Edcom 2, our uh, Executive Director, Dr. Carol Yee, together with the members of the Standing Committee on Tibet and Lifelong Learning, 
nandito rin si uh, former secretary D DG Irene uh, they have been going around the country I think uh, the last time you were in Cebu and uh, undertaking consultations research to understand what uh, uh, lifelong learning means for our uh, kababayans so malaking inisyatibo po ang uh, EDCOM 2 para mapalaki po natin at uh, uh, um, magawa iyong ating uh, initiatives upang mabigyan natin ng makabulong pagbabago ang mga Pilipino sa pamamagitan ng mga reforma sa ating edukasyon at training system. Kasama na po dyan yung TVET at ang lifelong learning opportunities para sa mga Pilipino. So sa punod dulo, magtatapos na po ako, sa punod dulo nito uh, ay uh, malinaw ang ating layunin. How do we make the system work for our people? How do we ensure that this framework will lead them to obtaining quality employment? Again, I'm looking, we are all, I'm sure, looking forward to a fruitful and productive discussion this morning. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. At uh, this juncture, we will give the floor sa ating uh, mga resource persons. Unahin po natin ang... Uh, Department of uh, Education, hindi ko po alam sino hong magpipresent, sino hong magsasalita for DepEd, uh, ASEC, USEC. Sige po, uh, USEC Gina, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning to you and good morning to everybody. At the outset, Mr. Chair, we'd like to state that the Department of Education has been working hard <laughs> to implement the objectives of the PQF. Uh, the Vice President actually has uh, uh, really been working closely with the National Coordinating Council since she assumed office in uh, 2022. Uh, with me, uh, Mr. Chair, is our Assistant Secretary for Curriculum and Teaching, who is, uh, well, um, would I say, the DepEd uh, focal person for the Philippine Qualifications Framework, and uh, she will present uh, implementation updates on PQF. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Yusek Gina. I give the floor to uh, Asek Alma Torio. Ma'am, yes. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Joel, and thank you, Ma'am Gina. Good morning again, you, uh, Senator Joel and Senator... Binay and to all our resources speakers. Um, at the outset, uh, we would like to mention that uh, DepEd had uh, actively participated in all the committee hearings for this uh, pending Senate bills. Uh, and uh, our pr presentation today will deal on the uh, deliverables which had been uh, uh, identified or committed during our uh, second TWG meeting held last uh, March 30, uh, 2022. And of course, uh, in, um, in response also to the points uh, mentioned by, by our chair, uh, the status of the implementation of PQF as far as uh, DEPED is concerned, and the uh, the, and how DepEd address, uh, addresses the lifelong learning development. And for the second concern, uh, Mr. Chair, will as, as committed during the second TWG meeting, we'll have a presentation on the ALS framework. So, uh, Mr. Chair, we have two presentations. First is on the PQF updates as far as uh, uh, its implement as as far as DepEd, DepEd as far as uh, the immediate concern of uh, DepEd in the PQF uh, implementation, and the second presentation is on ALS framework. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Ch yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, you mentioned earlier that uh, in the PQF uh, uh, framework or di or in the PQF diagram, and this is also contained in the uh, report made by World Bank when it uh, reviewed the PQF uh, uh, implementation. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, basic education serves as the foundation of the different uh, PQF uh, descriptors. And, and, uh, uh, and for this, uh, DepEd recognizes that uh, there is an issue why our basic education 
had not been afforded a PQF uh, level descriptor. And so during the eighth uh, PQF, PQF meeting presided over by our PQF chair, our VP secretary, Ma'am Sara, uh, DepEd through our Bureau of Curriculum Development presented a proposal for the inclusion of uh, junior high school and senior high school in the PQF diagram. And during that meeting, and this was also mentioned during the second TW meeting for this uh, proposed Senate bill. Uh, and as, as mentioned in that meeting, we committed to submit a position paper on that. Uh, uh, and going back to the eighth uh, PQF, PQF meeting, the, uh, the PQF NCC uh, members uh, did not object on the proposal, but uh, recommended that uh, this will be subject to public consultation. And the public consultation for that proposal was held last August 2, uh, August 2, 2023. And uh, when, uh, when the PQF and NCC uh, convened last August 3, we presented before the PQF NCC the results of uh, the public consultation. And Mr. Chair, we are uh, sharing uh, uh, to all the honorable members of this uh, Senate committee hearing the uh, presentation we made during that public consultation. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So may I invite you on the, uh, uh, on the screen, we have the slide deck prepared for that presentation the DepEd's position on the PQF levels. Next slide, please. So the issue is uh, basic education completion does not correspond to any of the levels in the Philippine Qualifications Framework. So that is the existing framework. Uh, level one to level four corresponds to the NC NC as well as the diploma uh, provided by TESDA and uh, the rest of the levels uh, correspond to the level provided by our CHED. And uh, as, as can be seen uh, in the existing PQF diagram, uh, the basic education is not afforded a level descriptor, but rather serves as the foundation of the various levels. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, we, we recognize that one of the functions of the PQF NCC is to review the PQF. That's the very reason, Mr. Chair, that we submitted the proposal before the PQF NCC. Can you have that uh, proposal, a uh, copy of that proposal? Yes, Mr. Chair. We'll submit yeah. after this thank, Senate thank you. hearing. Uh, I'm sorry to 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 to, uh, to interrupt, but uh, how, many, how many times na nag-meeting ang uh, PQF NCC? Uh, Mr. Chair, as part uh, of the internal... Mo lang bale, no? uh, we have... Uh, TESDA serves as the internal secretariat of the PQF NCC. The last meeting was held... Uh, last August 3, and uh, I understand that's the ninth PQF uh, NCC meeting. Ninth Chief. meeting for the past five years. Tama po ba? Just, just to put on record. Yes, ninth, ninth meeting, ma'am, sirs. Ah, uh, taon-taon ho ako nag-follow up dito kasi, no? And then, uh, I, I, I read about the uh, World Bank recommendation, yung strengthening ng PQF leadership, capacity building, pilot test, single quality assurance system. I can go on and on and uh, one by one, i-share ko po sa inyo. But yung, yung basic na to meet, yan, lagi naming binabanggit yan, no? So, nakaka-ninth pa lang. Uh, in charge po dito ang DepEd. Kayo po ang on top of things. In fact, the first uh, thing that I mentioned to VP Sara when I saw her, na siya na yung DepEd Secretary, sabi ko, I'm so happy na kayo po dahil 
hindi ho gumagalaw yung PQF at uh, DepEd po yung on top of things dito. Uh, sa PQF NCC, ang number one binigay na recommendation ng World Bank ay magtalaga o mag-establish ng permanent secretariat strengthening of working groups and inviting economic and industry experts as regular members. So what's the status now of... Uh, at nandito rin po yun, no sa batas, RA10968 or the PQF Act. Um... Nakalagay po dito ang pag the PQF yung proposed PQF NCC permanent secretariat organizational structure and functions. So ang question ko ho, meron na po ba ano ano po ba yung status ng uh, constitution of the PQF NCC's permanent secretariat and uh, official na po ba ito? Uh, meron na rin po bang mga position that have been approved by the DBM, if any, for the permanent uh, secretariat. Because we are in a budget season. Uh, on the other room, nandun yung DBCC. I can uh, lobby for it kung hindi pa rin, kung hindi pa rin ito tapos. But uh, I, I wanted to put on record my utmost disappointment kasi every year binabanggit po natin ito. Hindi ko naman sinisisi yung ngayon na nakaupo dahil bago lang po kayo. So, but still, imagine, kahit na isang taon na po kayo sa DepEd, sa TESDA o sa, sa CED, yung siyam na beses mag-meeting for the education uh, sector ng uh, NCC, parang kulang pa rin ho, no? just, just to put on record. Can, can you answer my first question? Yun lang yung constitution ng uh, permanent secretary. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, it was also mentioned during the eighth meeting presided over by our uh, secretary and the chair of the PQF NCC that uh, DepEd will, uh, uh, DepEd, for now it's TESDA which serves as the interim secretariat of the PQF NCC, but during that meeting it was proposed that DepEd will uh, uh, take the permanent secretariat of the PQF NCC and nandun pa ho ako sa PQF NCC when we decided that definitely DepEd ang magiging uh, lead dito may mga kasama ba ako ma'am nandun na kayo noon no <laughs> parang natawa ako doon parang Mr. Chair, yes, uh, DJ. May, may I intervene po? And being the interim technical secretariat, I would like to make a presentation of what had transpired uh, since then and up to now, up until now. So, can I request the secretariat? Of yeah, the sure, 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 uh, DJ Rose. But uh, just just to put on record, meron na na constitute na ba yung permanent secretariat? Hindi pa rin. It has not been constituted. So definitely, wala pa rin plantilla positions. We came up po with a pi um, public forum. There was a proposal which was um, done by TESDA on this. Then we we made... A, we had a consultation with the public. So after five years, my consultation pa rin, yung public consultation. Opo. But out of the nine meetings, four of which had been done during the uh, term po of VP Sara, which means to say, mas mabilis po yung PQF NCC. Yeah, I'm glad, ngayon. I'm glad. I'm, I'm very hopeful and uh, happy that VP Sara is... Uh, Taking this seriously, the past administration, parang wala eh. Parang hindi, hindi nila pinansin. So may I present? Uh, sige, sige. Po, Pwede. Mr. Chair. Pwede. PQF muna tayo para hindi tayo okay. mawala. No. Sige. So, um, may I request the DG? Pwede bang, Pwede bang iklian natin? Sige po. Say, looking at all of you, alam nyo sa education sector, yung 5 minutes, 50 <laughs> minutes yun eh. Oo. Yes, sir. Sige. Please, please. May I request for the Secretariat to... Can we uh, have our presentation? Our 
Our presentation po will cover updates on the PQF's governance, including membership of the Council and the Permanent Secretariat. We will also provide updates on PQF implementation via the PQF NCC working groups. First slide, please. Second slide, the role of NCC is to facilitate the harmonization of qualifications for the seamless movement of learners, of workers. So as you are very well aware, the PQF NCC is chaired by the Secretary of Education and has the following members, Secretary of Labor and Employment, Commission on Higher Education, Chair, Professional Regulation Commission. Chair, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, Director General Secretary. Representatives from the economic and industry sectors shall also be identified. Third slide, the PQF NCC working groups and their respective lead agencies are as follows. TESDA is in charge of the qualification register. Quality Assurance is chaired by CHED and co-chaired by TESDA. Pathways and Equivalencies is led by CHED. Information and Guidelines is led by DepEd. International Alignment is chaired by PRC. Government Industry Education is led by DOLE and TESDA. DepEd and TESDA are in charge of lifelong learning. During the pandemic, one of the key milestones was the review carried out in 2021, initiated by TESDA with technical assistance from the World Bank as part of the Future of Jobs project. The purpose of this PQF review is to evaluate various aspects of the framework, including utilization and implementation. The study conducted that the PQF is built on a robust framework, but its implementation is weak with limited utilization and evidence of labor market impact. The policy recommendations did, however, pave the way for the PQF NCC to study the next steps for implementing the PQF. The following were the highlights of the policy recommendation. PQF satisfies the primary aim of qualification by preserving the relevance and effectiveness of knowledge, skills, values, and application based on the PQF principles and structure. PQF can be rapidly reinforced by increasing its essential governance structure. Recognizing the PQF as a nation's major human resource development tool, it is vital to increase distribution efforts and public awareness, not only among educational institutions, but also among relevant stakeholders. There were total nine council meetings. Four were held under the leadership of the new PQF NCC VP Secretary Duterte. That is September 20, 2022, December 14, 2022, February 3, 2023, and August 3, 2023. It had fast-tracked the establishment of the PQF NCC Permanent Secretariat through the approval and endorsement of the proposed organization structure, function, plantilla position, salary grades, duties and responsibilities of the PQF NCC Permanent Secretariat with corresponding PQF NCC Resolution number 2023-01, Series of 2023. Towards completion of the PQF NCC membership with the identification of the economic and sector representative, creation and maintenance of the Philippine Qualifications Register, and the approval of the Philippine Credit Transfer System policy document. The PQF composition, NCCs, and membership have been finalized. Um, we have identified and included the representatives from the economic and industrial sectors, which will be represented by Dr. Albert Phoenix, Governor of the Employers' Confederation of the Philippines, nominated for the economic sector, Dr. Jesus Aranza will represent the Federation of Philippine Industries and Mr. Antonio Sayo representing the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry as non-voting member from the industry sector. 
The Council has approved three nominated members through the PQF-NCC Resolution Number 2023-04 for signature of the Council members. The above-mentioned representatives will re be recommended for appointment to the President's Office. To re-echo Chapter 4 of the Philippine Development Plan 2023-2028 states that one of the strategies is for the government to strengthen PQF-NCC and its governance structure, establish the PQF Secretariat, and enable budgetary support mechanisms for the PQF institutionalized NCC activities. Sige, so ang status is that meron na, may resolution already uh, submitted to DBM. Is that to correct? the office of the president, or to be submitted to the office of the president because according to VP Sara, she will personally uh, go to the office of the president to lobby for that yes. uh, particular yes. Uh, yes, and another uh, avenue is through Congress. Up. Considering that we have uh, we are uh, deliberating their budget, so siguro bigyan darin kami ng kopya ng resolution. Yes, pa. Please, thank you. So, uh, may I proceed, please, please, please sir please, chair? Uh, I hope it's not too long, uh, Rose. Kasi ang dami pong Sige, please. So, may I now go to the. You mismong permanent secretariat, section 19 of the PQF implementing rules and regulation, as shown in this slide, states that the permanent technical secretariat shall be led by a full time executive director with the rank of assistant secretary with three divisions in charge of providing technical and administrative services. So that's the proposed organizational structure. Wala na bang ilalaki yun? Masyadong maliit po. Tatanungin ko nga kung pwede, pwede pang mas maliit. Tapos bigyan nyo kami ng ano, microscope. <laughs> we will provide you po yeah. with a copy of that, Mr. Yeah, yung, Chair. Yung pin-provide sa akin din, ito eh. So kailangan ako magsalamin. <laughs> yeah. Sige, uh, meron na tayong ano, may uh, estimate na tayo as to... How much are we needing? Kasi tinitignan ko rin yung budget ng PQF for the past five years. Parang isang pangkain lang dito eh. Uh, anyway, may, meron na. May corresponding uh, budget proposal na for this. Um, we will provide you, Mr. Chair, of the details including yung budget proposal po. Because that's that's, I'm sure... Uh, dun interested ang DBM para at paano natin may didepend sa ito. Sige, please. Yes, Mr. Chair. So, um, of course, may I now proceed to the next slide. After that is the Pathways and Equivalences Working Group facilitated the issuance of a joint policy document on the implementation of the Philippine Credit Transfer System ratified by TESDA and CHED. According, the Council adopted the Philippine Credit Transfer System Policy through PQF-NCC Resolution Number 2023, 2023 Series num of 2023, Number 3. The PCTS is a formal policy approach to supporting learners to progress in their learning based on assessment of their achievement of learning outcomes in qualifications accredited by CHED and registered by TESDA. There have been so in reference to that, um, there have been zonal orientations that were conducted to various uh, stakeholders from April to July 2023. PCTS is being pilot in, piloted in agriculture and biosystems engineering, dentistry, hotel and restaurant management, hospitality management. Both agencies are also eyeing to include courses in information technology, games development, and animation. Next, the Philippine Qualifications Register is a national database of quality assured qualifications authorized by the PQF mandate mandated agencies. It is a searchable list that is publicly available and linked to government website. TESDA as the lead agency constantly updates and maintains the database. 
Chad, PRC, and TESDA have made a commitment to include the appropriate Philippine Qualifications Framework level on all newly issued or renewed diplomas, national certificates, and professional identification cards by end of 2023, which was adopted to a PQF NCC resolution number 2023 uh, 02 series of 2023 to safeguard the integrity the PICWAR working group will prepare the relevant quality assured mechanisms so um mr chair the one that has been also shared by defed are one among those that have been uh, posted as the activities, um, particularly on the updating of the PQF level, uh, PQF framework, which was also subjected to a public forum, back to back with the public forum on the organizational structure of the permanent secretariat, which was conducted last August 2 through an online public consultation. So, um, of course, it will continue to engage on in-depth discussions with other stakeholders about improving the PQF design to ensure its relevance and applicability. Lastly, we will continue to lead the advocacy and promotion of the PQF in order to gain public acceptance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That's... Uh... That's comprehensive and uh, ano ba sasabihin ko? Nakaka-uplift na. Kanina medyo. Let's go with Ched. Uh, can we hear from Dr. Uh, Cherry, Mel Melanie Ancheta Jego? Ay, Kli yung pangalan nyo, ma'am. <laughs> Sige po, ma'am. Good morning, Sir Chair and to our Honorable uh, Senators. Ako ang tatawagin sa totoong pangalan ko din kasi mas mahaba yata yung totoong pangalan ko sa'yo. Yes, Sir Thank Chair. You. Thank you. Just yes, Sir. Um, I came in with Jed the last quarter of 2019. And the first priority I said to my team is to prioritize non-conventional higher education programs. And included in this is the implementation of the Philippine credit transfer system, even the expanded tertiary education and accreditation program. Sir, at the outset, we would like to thank you for your support together with your team, because with you, we were able to keep the PCTS program running, even the ETEA program. And we also thank our partners on behalf of the Technical Working Group for Pathways and Equivalencies along with TESDA, along with DOLE, PRC, and of course, the Department of Education. Being the lead of the Pathways and Equivalencies, we really started and pushed for its implementation, even though the pandemic came in, that quite halted our efforts. So on behalf of Chair Popoy, Chair Pio Popoy is also very passionate about it. And in fact, he has many press releases because our principle is always anchored and access. But may I add, Sir Chair, sustainability of the program because it should not only be now, but it should be one that we need to continue even in the years to come. So for the Commission on Higher Education, we were able to push for the Commission and Bank to have it endorsed to the Philippine Qualifications Framework National Coordinating Council. Pwede pong request yung slide. There po. And so we thank also our Honorable Vice President to really um, making it way that we were able to have it approved before the PQF NCC. And this was already included as well in the report of our good Director General of the TESDA, uh, DG or the NETA. So, sir, uh, we were able to get PQF resolution. Uh, <laughs> Apologies, ma'am. Thank you, pa. <laughs> na promote. <laughs> na promote ba? <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind. I wow. Well. Thank you, sir, Senator. And let me continue. So with um, the PCTS approval, we continued to work with our working groups uh, with the other agencies. 
So we were able to have the joint memorandum circular between CHED and TESDA on the implementation of the PCTS. So then on, all systems are rolling that we started to develop frameworks and we continue to implement the priority disciplines that was mentioned already by um, TESDA a while ago during their report. And we thank our experts from PRC, Dr. Garcia, Dr. Cueto, and Director Arudier for being on top of um, the implementation of these pilot programs for these disciplines. But sir, we are not limited to these disciplines. Our ways forward, I'm going to tell you, of the other disciplines. I, I was about to uh, interrupt and ask you that question because I was looking at the... Uh, uh, piloted programs, agricultural and biosystems, engineering, dentistry, hotel and restaurant management, hospitality management, additional programs in information technology and games development and animation. Yes, sir. Are, are I think you would love the other disciplines which yes. you would like to expand on. Yeah, that's 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 my uh, that's I'm what I'm interested about. What uh, uh, what are your priorities yes, sir. Uh, in the rolling out of uh, PCTS? Yes, academic. sir. So after all the series of public consultations, orientations, bringing in both higher education institutions and TVET institutions and meetings of the technical working group for pathways and equivalencies, we have our pathways forward. Next slide, please. So we continue to do capacity building because, sir, we know that to implement the PCTS, we need to capacitate our stakeholders. We are done with our HEIs and our quality assessment team. We go through our technical panel of experts from both CHED and TESDA. We have already scheduled simultaneous workshops for the development of the specific policies and guidelines because we need to do the matching of learning outcomes for higher ed and TVET institutions. So we are expanding, sir, eto na po yan. Industrial technology, midwife. Sir, we have already approved the PSG for industrial technology. So we can roll with that. Midwifery, games development, the Bachelor of Technical Vocational Teacher Education, nursing, we are looking at that, nursing and dietetics, and radiologic technology. And if there are other disciplines, we would like to work on those and expand further because we would like to cover actually all programs. Curious, lang, ma'am, for curiosity's sake, what are, what, are your, uh, what are the criteria being used to, uh, in, in choosing such... Uh, uh, trade discipline or courses? Uh, we are looking at priority disciplines as well, sir. Uh, as has been agreed by both CHED and TESDA, we know that at the moment, um, dentistry, HM, and... Um, pa paano nga po yung HM? Nag Tagtatalo uh, kami dito, sabi ko, yung H HM siguro hotel management. Yeah, hotel management. The TM, hindi naman TESDA. Tourism Pan management. Okay. Pre previously, sir, it was called hotel and restaurant management, and then they transformed it to HM and tourism. Actually, most of our HEIs offer the TM and HM. And uh, we have prepared actually the MOA ready for signing for agriculture and biosystems engineering, expecting something about 90 HEIs together with TVET to, to help us join with that. Uh, we are trying to identify how many would go with would enter into MOU with um, the other courses, but we are going to do simultaneous workshops for the other disciplines for both CHED and TESDA experts sitting together, because the principle here, sir, is there must be a joint design of the programs specifically and the matching of learning outcomes, and we look forward, sir, to a big event. Uh, before the year ends for an overall MOU signing between higher education institutions and TVIs on the full round of implementation of the PCTS. Sir, it doesn't stop from there. Next slide. <laughs> Meron pa po, sir. Pwede diretso ko na po sa ITEA. Yeah. So, sir, we were able to revise the PSGs for the expanded tertiary education and equivalency program because we wanted to have more institutions to be deputized for the various disciplines. So we were able to have it approved by the CEB. Ang maganda dito, sir, it allows consortium of HEIs. Binaba na po natin yung age from 25 to 23. Bumaba yung level accreditation to level 2. And look at also priority disciplines as may be recommended also by the regional development councils with um our universities, both colleges, public and private colleges and universities as well. 
and we have done the training and the orientation. And we hope that we will be able to improve, um, increase. We have increased from, now we have 100, 107 of our higher education institutions. So we hope that we will be able to increase it. Because now, sir, the processing of ETEAP to make it faster is now downloaded to the regional offices. Uh, we will be happy to bring you more good news as to the updates on the number of HEIs who have applied in the regional offices and to be brought for the commission and bank for approval. Um, we were given a budget of $2 million under GAA before. Uh, I'm not sure, but in the NEP, we were informed that we have 5M for this. But $3 million goes to PS and to something for the MOOE. I, I suppose, ma'am, yung CMO 29 series of 2021, uh, for implementation pa lang kasi yun, no? Kasi I'm looking at the uh, uh, data that uh, Ched gave us. Yung enrollees and graduates of uh, ETIAP from 2016 to 2020. I'm just looking at 2018 to 2021. Yung percentage of graduates from 63.97%. Can we show this uh, slide? Uh, this stuff natin. Um, from 63.97% ng 2018-2019, sa 2019-2020, 46.37% na lang. Tapos pagdating ng 2020-2021, 38.89% na lang. So, medyo concerned ako dyan sa figures na yan. Uh, yeah, no? From uh, 63% to 43%. Tapos 38%. I don't know kung may wala pa si I'm sure wala pa yung data nung Apa. 21 to ano. So, concerned lang ako, ma'am. Uh, baka lang uh, uh, tama itong figures na to, no, ma'am? Ah, yes, sir. We, we, we gave you the figures and actually we have acknowledged that as one of the concerns that we would like to really look into. The reason why uh, we are having vigorous advocacy on the TEAP, not just for increase in the number of deputized HEIs, but the increase in the number of students and graduates who will be products of the TEAP program. enrollees na yan. How many of those that apply do not meet the uh, assessment scheme and uh, for what reason? Can, can we have that uh, uh, data? Um, maybe we'll be happy to give you a report, sir, because we are going to gather it from our deputized higher education institutions. And I think those will be our launching pads uh, to provide you more um, interventions on this okay. aspect. Siguro isama na lang din po doon yung how many of the enrollees of the uh, ETIAP are those that were not able to finish yung uh, formal education or were graduates of alternative learning systems. Tapos yung uh, reasons nila cited by uh, the enrollees for not uh, being able to complete the ETEAP para meron tayong uh, data. Yes, sir. Uh, in the new CMO, sir, we have expanded even the Dinahin coverage. Nakita ko, pero 2021 pa yung uh, implementation. So hopefully, sir, yeah. oh, moving yeah, onwards, address tong, uh, we can address. Sige. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. Please. And even if uh, we are not lead to the other uh, working groups, uh, we have taken initiatives for the other areas, like for example, qualifications registry, our OPRICAM now is going around the region to update our database. So we'll be able to help test on that. Of course, um, we, I have a last slide, please. Next po. There. Uh, pabalik po. Yan na lang po. So I think this is my last slide, Sir Chair. Um, we have made an agreement with Dolly though we are not a part the lead for industry, but we are expecting to hold a government industry education sector summit. And this will increase our advocacy for this PCTS and ETEA programs. Of course, uh, I have mentioned the updating of the qualifications registry. And um, I think what is significant there is we have created our technical, the CEB approved a technical working group for lifelong learning that will work hand in hand with our partner agencies. Reason why Dr. Ethel Valenzuela is also joining us because we will assist support in the rolling out of lifelong learning. Uh, PQF being the basic principle is lifelong learning itself. With that, Sir Chair, we'd like to thank you and we hope for your continuing support that we will be able to carry on and sustain the PCTS and 
and other non-conventional programs. Thank you, Sir Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we'll uh, give the floor now to PRC, Commissioner uh, Jose Cueto, sir. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In behalf of the Ay, PRC... Naman, sir. Yeah. <laughs> In behalf of the PRC, let me give this uh, initial or preliminary report because uh, my presentation, PowerPoint presentation, will be on CPD. If you look at the timeline of... Uh, lives of our people at five to six years, after five to six years of life, they enter kindergarten. Then six years of elementary education, four years of secondary education, four to five years of tertiary education, totaling about uh, 15, 16, or 17 years as their educational preparation. But for regulated professions, they will work for 40 to 60 years before retiring. And the longest time of their lives will be spent under the regulation or authority of the Professional Regulation Commission. And that's the reason why we have emphasis on the implementation of the CPD law, which already includes the career progression and specialization program. As part of our initiative, and uh, we have been discussing this already when we were crafting the Philippine Credit Transfer System because we were involved in crafting the PCTS. We have already identified the post-degree stage and with the uh, recommendation by the World Bank in 2021 to add the column of professional qualifications in the diagram of the PQF, we have already come up with a system because we have the CPSP, which is actually part of the CPD law. There are two pathways for entry. One is the licensure exam, which is the most common. But uh, if you look at the education system, in many professions, the attrition rate is also very high, meaning 70 to 80% attrition rate. And this is very alarming because only about uh, 20 to 30 percent would finish their courses. And if they take the license or examinations, depending on the passing percentage, we can identify the trend. There would be license or examinations which would be uh, in the range of 30 percent, but the highest is uh, about 80 percent. So we have very, some professions have very low passing percentage. So that's another hurdle in their success to become professionals. So aside from the licensure examinations, it's recognition of prior learning or RPL. So these are the two pathways. And the other initiative for the PRC is to incorporate the PQF level and hopefully in the future, the AQRF level in the professional uh, identification card. So that wherever they go, they will now be able to show their PQF level, and hopefully that will make them really aware and conscious of the value of the PQF level. Unfortunately, we don't cover non-regulated professions, so that's still a, uh, identified as gap because there's no government agency in charge of non-regulated professions. This always comes up in our conferences, and we could not answer because uh, there's no... Uh, Provision in professional regulatory laws that we also regulate non-regulated professions. And uh, out-of-school youth, for example. So those are, I think, some of the gaps which uh, we will have to answer because uh, there are bills for lifelong learning. And uh, let me now go to the updates on the CPD because this is the most important uh, contribution of the Professional Regulation Commission as far as lifelong learning is concerned. Uh, next slide. Sorry, let me try. So updates on the implementation. Okay, so it's now working. Can we go back? So the first uh, table shows how many renewed their PRC IDs. Three million for the last, uh, uh, I think, 2018 to 2022. 
but 1.3 million utilized undertaking. Mr. Chair, during the pandemic, because of restrictions in mobility and professionals could not go to PRC offices to renew their PRC IDs, and because of the passage of the uh, lapse into law of the CPD law, that they should have obtained a number of CPD credit units before they are allowed to renew their PRC IDs. PRC came up with the undertaking that they signed the undertaking, but for the next renewal, if, for example, they have only 30, but the requirement is 45, so they have a balance of 15. For the next renewal, the 15 balance will be added to the 45. But up to now, up to December of this 2020, uh, 2023, uh, undertaking is still allowed. But because the national health emergency has already been lifted, we may be forced to already terminate the undertaking. So that's the, that's the issue, Mr. Chair. As far as the attendance of professionals in accredited CPD programs are concerned, for the last uh, 2018 to 2022, we have 18 million professionals who engage in uh, CPD delivered by accredited CPD programs. Now, number of professionals who were granted benefited by CPD based on professional work experience, formal, informal learning, and self-directed learning. We actually do not have a disaggregation among the three professional work experience, but uh, we have figures regarding uh, self-directed learning. So you can see the figures. 34,000, 42,000 from the accredited. Then the next is the accreditation of other activities that did not go through CPD accreditation. So that has already been reflected and issued equivalent CPD units to applications filed under the formal learning. Uh, those who took up postgraduate study or diploma programs, a uh, smaller number, that's for the academic track. And uh, I'm sorry, this is small. These are active CPD providers which are distributed among 16 regional offices of the PRC. So that was a reflection of how many CPD providers are located in its regions. But of course, uh, as expected, we have the biggest number in the NCR because we have the biggest number of professionals in the national capital region. Accredited CPD programs, the top five are accountancy with a, with a big total of 21,000, medicine, 11,000, professional teachers, 7,000, nursing, 5,000, medical technology, uh, about 2,004. That's the top five. But in totality, we have 74,331 accredited CPD programs available to professionals. The professions with bilateral, international, or mutual recognition agreements, we have uh, architecture, accountancy, engineering, the 12 engineering professions, we have medicine, dentistry, and nursing, and we have framework agreement on surveying qualifications. So all of these, uh, they are required to comply with CPD requirements because those are in the documents of the ASEAN MRAs. Now, we also have APEC, Human Resource Development Working Group, but it only involves uh, engineers and architects. Then we have a list of uh, professions uh, requiring compliance to CPD. I'm sorry for the small font. Uh, we have about... Uh, <laughs> Uh, sorry, sir. We will be able to get a formal report for you. So that's uh, a total of uh, nine, uh, 11. So renewal of PRC IDs uh, that's reflected in this slide. But if you look at the, those uh, 
registered and with valid professional identification cards. We have a total of renewals of 3 million, but we have a registered uh, number of registered professionals at 5 million. So there's a difference between registered and active. So we classify the active as those who have been renewing their PRC IDs for the last three years. Number of government agencies uh, incorporating CPD in their human resource development plans and programs. Actually, in the uh, PRC law, we encourage government and private institutions to also incorporate CPD programs or training programs that will benefit their own employees. Private institutions, active CPD providers, there are 960, 906 private entities who have active CPD provider accreditation. Then report and learning outcomes. We have been uh, dealing with the learning outcomes with the CPD, but unfortunately, with the thousands of CPD providers, these are not assessed that adequately, and the learning outcomes are not that uh, documented and stored in our database. Instead, what is being what has been focused on is the number of CPD credit units, and we want to change that because uh, now the focus uh, or the cornerstone will become the career progression specialization program rather than the pure CPD programs. But the CPD programs will contribute to a certain qualifications. So it's more important to focus on the learning outcomes rather than in the number of CPD credit units because it's very difficult to relate the volume of learning with 45 credit units. So that's in section 12 of RA number 10912 that there should be a CPSP for every profession. For the, uh, for the establishment of specialization programs, we have 12 steps. And uh, at the present time, we have 28 out of 46 professional regu regulatory boards, which have officially created their respective CPSP cuts committees, which will be responsible for setting up specialization programs. So we classify 46 professions into those with relatively advanced specialization, especially with medicine and dentistry, those in the middle stage, uh, and of course, there are still in the initial stages of setting up their specializations. In the discussion of the Philippine Development Plan of 2023-2028, the PRC was asked uh, what will be, will we be submitting as evidence of the impact of the CPD? And I actually answered that uh, we cannot just come up with figures on number of professionals who engage in CPD activities. It has to be more than that. And I think that uh, we agreed in the PRC that it should be number of professionals who advance from level 6 to level 7 and those who advance from level 7 to level 8. But that will be realized when all of the 46 professions will have established their specialization programs. But we will be able to start with those professions which have more advanced specialization programs beginning in, hopefully, in 2024, 2025. So in the FICWAR, there are 15 professional qualification titles, and it involves uh, engineering professions and, of course, dentistry. Dentistry is... Uh, most advanced uh, because it's being led by our program manager for the CPSP. Sino ba yun? Sino yun? <laughs> yun? We, we, we treat dentistry as the model as far exactly. as specialization is concerned. First, eh, sa registry and the uh, talagang sabi ng Bible si give honor to whom honor is due. Kaya banggitin natin si Dr. Melinda Garcia. Kaya. Yes, Your Honor. And I think uh, we have been there since 2012 when we used to go to TESDA for meetings hosted by the Honorable Chairman. Any years. 
So number of validated and recognized creditable units for transfer. Actually, we're still working on this. The CPSP cuts. And uh, we are also looking at the principles of the ETF for application for professions. Because, uh, for example, in the profession of medicine, where we have 83 specializations, not all of those who uh, undergo residency training pass the competency assessment. These are the certifying boards. And if the range of uh, passing percentage is only around 50 to 60 percent, there would be 50 or 40 to 50 percent who would fail the certifying examinations. But they would continue to practice the specialty field because in the Medical Act of 1959, which is one of the oldest professional regulatory laws, there is no distinction between general practice and specialty practice. And we're looking at the possibility of utilizing recognition of prior learning as maybe one of the pathways by which they would be recognized. We have already submitted the position paper, Your Honor, and uh, we have uh, different uh, suggestions. Primarily, the removal of the link between uh, CPD credit units and renewal of the PRC ID. The source or the root cause of the complaints is that this is threatening to many groups of professionals because if they cannot renew their PRC IDs, they may lose their jobs. So that's the primary uh, request uh, uh, from the PRC. And we have already submitted the uh, position paper, Your Honor. So hopefully this will be reviewed by the committee. And as far as the lifelong learning uh, is concerned, we commit to advance uh, the lifelong learning component uh, of the PQF as far as coverage of the PRC is concerned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Before I let you go, uh, Dr. Cueto, yung, uh, I'm sure you are aware of the PQF law, yung Section 9, which provides that uh, PRC and the uh, uh, CHED shall review the system of assessment of uh, learning outcomes and uh, align them with the Philippine Qualifications uh, Framework. Can, can, can we get an update on this, uh, yeah. sir? Mr. Chair, we actually have conducted uh, a meeting between PRC and CHED. And as far as the licensure examinations uh, are concerned, our table specifications which contain the competency standards is actually based on the policy standards and guidelines of the CHED governing its profession. So there's a commonality between the learning outcomes being uh, acquired in their, in their courses, in the undergraduate courses, and what is being tested by the PRC as far as licensure examinations are concerned. So I think we have a much of the learning outcomes being assessed. Our only problem is uh, because in the CPD, we have uh, more than 70,000 CPD providers. We have monitors and evaluators, but the main weakness is the assessment of learning outcomes because the focus is on the number of CPD credit units earned. Hopefully, we will be able to make that kind of uh, intervention, to focus more on the learning outcomes, especially since there's a provision that CPD activities should contribute to the attainment of a higher qualification title. At the, the, the end of the day, should be aligned also with the uh, the uh, intention of the Philippine Qualifications Framework. So, yun yung bottom line, aligned po sila. Yes, Your Honor. So, we are working closely with the Commission on Higher Education. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Before we uh, hear from our uh, executive director ng EDCOM, can, can we hear from uh, EDC, Mr. Carlo uh, Fernando, the higher ed education lead, sir? Thank you, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for that very kind invitation to us. Um, good morning uh, to the honorable members of the Philippine Senate Subcommittee on the Philippine Qualifications Framework, particularly to you, Mr. Chair, Senator Villanueva, and of course to all of our 
all of our allies from uh, DepEd, also headed by Yusek Gina Gonong, and of course, Tesla DDG Rose, Edcom2, um, Dr. Carol Marquis, and of course, Dole and uh, Ched, of course, Director San Diego. Um, I'm, I'm Carlo Fernando, the Higher Education Lead of USAID Opportunity 2.0. Together with me is our Deputy Chief of Party, Dr. Maria Teresa Mohamad, and our Private Sector Advisor, Ms. Anjali Cruz. Mr. Chair, for today's presentation, I would like to present to, uh, for everyone the interventions and activities that we do, particularly to support the out-of-school youth in the Philippines. We operate in 15 cities nationwide, and also the challenges that we face in terms of providing the second chance opportunity to our out-of-school youth um, and also what, our, what are our policy recommendations that also support the provisions of uh, the proposed Senate bills. Mr. Chair, next slide please. USAID Opportunity 2.0 is a five-year program funded by the United States Agency for International Development or USAID and implemented by the Education Development Center. Um, just a brief background about EDC. EDC is a nonprofit organization based in the United States, and it operates in uh, more than 60 countries, um, and it has operated in the Philippines since 2006, leading interventions in early literacy and numeracy, conflict re resolution in Mindanao, particularly in Marawi and Zamboanga, and in workforce development. In 2020, we were fortunate to have been awarded a grant from USAID, uh, particularly uh, the USAID Opportunity 2.0, to strengthen education and workforce development systems to reach vulnerable yet valuable Filipino out-of-school youth so that they would have second chances in education, in training, in employment, in business, and in livelihood. The impetus for us, Mr. Chair, uh, to launch O2 is urgent given that uh, the rise, there is a rise of out-of-school youth in the country. And we also believe that uh, this proposed Senate bills regarding the Philippine Qualifications Framework to support it is also equally urgent. Um, we are here uh, to also represent the international non-government organization and also share our experiences from the field directly uh, so that we can also consider them in the um, discussion of the PQF. So we do our system strengthening work as shown on screen at three levels, at the national level, cross-site, and also at the local level. At the national level, Mr. Chair, we support and work with the Department of Education and in full support of the Matatag Agenda, particularly through the Office of uh, the Bureau of Alternative Education under USEC Gina Gonong and also headed by ASIC GH Ambat. Our team provides technical assistance to Bay on policy formulation, particularly the ALS Act, alongside its IRR. We co-develop the ALS curriculum, its materials, to ensure that ALS graduates would be embedded with soft skills, 21st century skills, and competencies needed for them to start their own small businesses and prepare them for jobs. Uh, we also funded a nationwide research study of ALS completers and also in, um, ensure that our ALS teachers are prepared to assist these lifelong learners or these out-of-school youth. We also collaborate with TESDA, particularly by assisting them to develop the five-year National Technical Education and Skills Development Plan. And our team has also developed the 21st Century Life Skills Modules from NCs 1 to 4, to ensure that the, our test the learners uh, would have the needed soft skills by today's industries. Finally, we also work with DTI, um, particularly in their youth entrepreneurship program, so that it would also catch and also support our out-of-school youth. In addition to the national level, uh, system, national level system strengthening work that we do, we also work with the private sector and with academia. To date, we have engaged around more than 1,300 private sector partners who also provide complementary training to our um, out-of-school youth uh, through work immersion opportunities. So we also support them with um, work immersion, job shadowing, etc. that complements the technical skills training of TESDA. In academe, we also provide grants, research grants, training delivery grants, and our uh, higher education institutions are also uh, maximizing the volunteerism of our college students to orient out-of-school youth to proceed to further education and training. Ultimately, uh, we also uh, support and also operate in our 15 cities 
at the city level, OTO has helped our local government units to establish their own out-of-school youth Development Alliance or the YDA, composed of various local actors from the LGU to industry, higher ed, NGOs, etc. The YDA serves as a mechanism for multi-sectoral and out-of-school youth responsive mechanisms to take place. Mr. Chair, with the Youth Development Alliance in our 15 cities, we support the provisions particularly on the improvement of governance and participation of stakeholders and also to boost resource mobilization and utilization that are articulated in Senate Bill 364. Um, these are our Youth Development Alliances from the 15 cities. We support the LGUs of Angeles, Quezon City, Valenzuela, Pasig, Legaspi, Cebu, Tagbilaran, Iloilo, Zamboanga, Isabela, Basilan, Cagayan de Oro, Davao, Jensen, Iligan, and Cotabato to develop the Youth Development Alliances. And we are proud to share that over the years of operations of Opportunity 2.0, the Youth Development Alliance serves as a possible model where resources from different actors can be shared for the continuous access of learning by our out-of-school youth. Uh, and this is also aligned to Section 8 on the idea of establishing learning cities um, as um, proposed in, in the Senate bill. The Youth Development Alliance uh, serves as a model for multi-stakeholder collaboration for lifelong learning. So, for instance, we are proud to share that in Valenzuela, for example, the Valenzuela City Youth Development Alliance initiated barangay-level orientations so that the out-of-school youth would be informed about second-chance learning opportunities. And uh, the, the out-of-school youth that they were able to orient are also then ferried or shepherded to PESO, DTI, to DepEd, to TESDA to ensure that our out-of-school youth would have access and information about these learning opportunities. Cagayan de Oro is also a fantastic youth development alliance wherein the members of the Youth Development Alliance contributed out of their own pockets a total number of more than 22 million pesos, uh, specifically for out-of-school youth support. These are funds from both public and private agencies to address the learning needs of, the, of their city's youth. And finally, Legaspi has shown immense innovations also uh, to support the out-of-school youth learning, wherein they established the Youth Network Executive Council that is elected by the out-of-school youth themselves to sit in the Youth Development Alliance. So through the Youth Network Executive Council, we believe that the out-of-school youth become leaders and they also, um, they also create their own pathways towards lifelong learning. They know what they want and they also encourage other out-of-school youth to support them in the process. So we also believe, Mr. Chair, that with and through the youth development mechanism, our partner cities would have templates, frameworks, and cost share for local resource inventory to ensure that their vision to become a learning city turns into reality. So here are some challenges that we feel are remaining persistent in, in the scope of providing these learning opportunities to our out-of-school youth. Number one, challenges in providing timely support for our ALS learners and expanding forms of investment to out-of-school youth programs. Second, there's a need to establish a mechanism to promote synergy and coordination for out-of-school youth lifelong learning at the regional and national levels. We believe that while, yes, there is uh, the concept of the Youth Development Alliance in our cities, there are also some constraints if the lifelong learning discussion or the second chance discussion is contained within the city. We still want to have like a macro level understanding of the out of school youth database, where they are, what are their needs, what are the factors that empower them to go back to school. Number three, Learning opportunities have some rigidity, uh, particularly for adult learners given competing priorities on work, family, and our livelihood. Uh, based on our experiences from the field, while yes, some of our youth would want to go back to school, they cannot because they have families to fend for, they have livelihoods to establish. And number four, access to, step, to test the scholarships for ALS learners might need more information on how to access these scholarships and also accessing opportunities in college-level education, particularly for former eligible college entrants uh, who are finishers of the ALS um, old curriculum.
So some policy recommendations for our consideration. Number one, strengthen articulation among line agencies, DEP, EDSHED, and TESDA, so that lifelong learning is clear and accessible and so that exit pathways are strengthened. Second, prioritize financial and academic support to out-of-school youth, ALS learners, and the working youth towards further education and training and provide possible a green lane or a dedicate, some de dedicated slots for learning in public education institutions. Number three, clarify and strengthen incentives to the private sector, especially pri uh, small businesses, for example, tax deductions to support lifelong learning and earning activities. And number four, institutionalize the Youth Development Alliance or an alliance of some nature as a model of a local multi-stakeholder body that is mandated to provide accessible and inclusive opportunities for our Filipino out-of-school youth. Mr. Chair, uh, this is our presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and we are very grateful for this presentation. Thank, thank you, Sir Carlo. No, just the... Before we continue, I'd like to put on record that we can actually eat because no one is eating. Uh, Nag-breakfast na yan, tapos yan na yung lunch. Wala pa rin nag-o-open. Na-try na yan, uh, safe po yan. Hindi naman bumula yung, uh, yung nag-try niyan. So please, please. Uh, just, just one quick question, uh, Sir Carlo, kasi I know that... Uh, uh, USAID uh, funded a uh, alternative learning study uh, uh, nito lang, I'm, I'm not sure of the dates but uh, I, I'm just curious of, of, of those that obtain gainful employment from alternative learning uh, system, is there is there a match in uh, qualifications and or skills with those required by the industry? Nagmamatch po ba? How do we, I mean, with, with regard to the study funded by uh, USAID? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it, is, it is correct. Uh, we have funded a national, a nationwide tracer study for ALS, uh, but it is yet to be awarded to a particular institution in Mindanao. Um, so it, it has yet to commence. Um, but we also are in the process of funding another study uh, about the perception of external stakeholders about ALS. What is the perception of uh, the um, of the private sector, of of uh, families, of parents, of different people regarding the ALS program? But in complementation to that, Mr. Chair, while that those uh, research studies would have yet to be awarded, we also conduct local labor market assessments in the cities. So this is um, with uh, less by our out-of-school youth and also um, in coordination with our private sector and with our academe. Our Deputy Chief of Marty but also want to add. Sure, please, please, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Dr. Mukamad. Yes. Good morning and thank you for this opportunity. Um, at the outset, I would really like to sincerely thank you for your big heart in sponsoring this bill. Uh, this will really benefit our out-of-school youth of this country and for them to be able to transition to gainful employment, further education, whether senior high school or, or college, and of course, self-employment. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we conduct, Carlo was right, uh, we conducted a labor, local labor market analysis in each of the site and this is participated by DOLE, all, all those youth development agencies, government and non-government has something to do with youth development programs. So uh, industry is there, the chamber is there and and of course our MSM is and the youth themselves because they, part they always uh, bring their voices on the table. Um, yes, there's a match because sometimes the skills and the interest of the out-of-school youth, uh, say, for example, the industry will say, we need more carpentry or, or buggers or, or cashiers in the malls. And, uh, and the youth will say, oh, I, I like those, but this is my skill. So what we did as a program is to have like an enhancement training dedicated for specific sector that the LLMA is producing so that there's a match. Thank you. And uh, with, with that, I would also like to put on record because I, I saw the challenges that you were talking about accessing test the scholarships, etc. There's a law called Tulong Trabaho Law. I don't know who authored that law, but uh, 
it's 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 a match to what you are uh, uh, trying to accomplish, and I I hope you also get a chance to to access this uh, and and benefit uh, through this uh, law that we uh, pursued, and uh, it, it's a good way for us, uh, you know, to discuss because at the end of the day we wanted to uh, determine whether graduates of alternative learning system or ETAP man, Ladrice education man, or other programs are actually able to uh, seamlessly move from one pathway to another. And uh, with that, I will give the floor to our uh, executive director, ang pinagmamalaki namin sa ed, Dr. <laughs> Carol Markey, wow. para ma-pressure ka din. So, you have Thank the you. floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your continued support to EDCOM and for your active participation in our commission's activities ever since January. And also for the opportunity to present here, I guess the directions of the conversations we have that relate to lifelong learning and Philippine qualifications framework. I'm not sure if Senator Joel remembers, in one of our first ever Commission meetings, we had a discussion that across key stages, where do you start building 21st century skills and soft skills? That was yung the commissioners we requested them to write on meta cards. Citizenship, where do you start building it and where do you end? Where do, when do you assess whether as a learner has citizenship or soft skills or grit? And how do you continuously monitor the growth of that and nurture that in our learners? See, si Senator Sani, I remember him saying that what we want are curious learners. Because you want them to be lifelong learners and it begins with curiosity. And how do you develop that and at what age do you begin? So I think one of our recent, I guess, realizations in our many conversations, part of it is in Australia also when we went there, was really how connected are we in articulating the 21st century skills we desire in our learners and how connected it is from ECCD Council to DepEd to TESDA and to CHED. Because we want it, but who is really accountable and who is monitoring it and how do we, how do we make sure that we are able to see through, see through that from our child. Because isang learner lang yan, mula pagkabata hanggang pagtanda. Naalala ko din yung test the alignment meeting ng EDCOM when Congressman Romulo asked DDG Rose na how does TESDA develop 21st century skills? And is it possible within a two-week or 700, 600-hour um, NC program, kaya bambuin yun doon? Kailan siya nagsisimula? At ano yung kayang magawa through TESDA's NC programs? So, usapin yan, and hopefully that is something that we could engage with the agencies here um, very actively in the coming months. Kasi, yes, there is a need for coordination, but coordination for what purpose and towards what ends needs to be clearer. And I think everyone is talking about the importance of soft skills. Okay na yung content, pwede nang i-Google yan. Pero yung soft skills, yung learner attributes, how are we actually doing it? And how are we coordinating in doing it and seeing it through in our learners who progress from ECCD all the way to higher education? Medyo question mark pa po. Um, and siguro, Mr. Chair, just to share the other insights that we've gathered through the TVET and lifelong learning consultations and sa PQF um, Pathways Task Force natin. The main intention po was to identify in our education system, kasi sabi nila, EDCOM 1 recommended trifocalization. And that resulted in sometimes lack of coordination. Pero siguro po ang pinakamahalaga, more than the institutional mechanisms to coordinate is, as a result of trifocalization, where are our learners falling through the cracks? Meron ba tayong dead ends or gray areas sa ating education system that make it difficult for our learners to continuously learn. So yun po yung naging usapin. Tatlong areas po. Unang-una, elementary dropouts. Kasi usually, pag elementary dropout, hindi ka makakapag-access technically ng TVET and higher education opportunities without first completing high school. Pero pagdating mo ng high school, tatanungin din namin, uh, sila Yusek Gina actually, yung sa SHS, Kasi dalawang bahagi, yung sa ALS po, hanggang 15 years old, dapat nasa formal system. Pero ano kung yung learner hindi talaga niya, hindi akma sa formal system, yung mechanism niya ng pagkatuto. Paano siya pwedeng matuto sa ibang paraan? Tapos pagdating ng high school, yung 11 and 12, I see in the presentation na 
to be implemented or going to be implemented pero mahalaga din po siya para tuloy-tuloy. Tapos marami pong usapin na what if yung SHS graduate iba yung track or strand na kinuha tapos magka-college tapos may academic bridging programs how is that being monitored? Kasi we also know that sometimes there are excessive bridging programs required. What are parameters that enable learners to actually pursue the path that they want without excessive um, disincentives? So, isa pong area yon. Ikalawang area yung level 5. And when I was in CHED, pinag-uusapan na po namin yun between CHED and TESDA. Kasi ang level 5, associate degree, diploma, certificate, alin doon yung sa CHED, alin doon yung sa TESDA, how do you operationalize that? Um, what counts as level 5? And how is it different when it is TESDA and when it is CHED? Um, kailangan pa ng mas maraming linaw. And then yung mga micro-credentials or internally ang joke po namin yung mga 0.5 mga 5.5 tsaka mga 6.5. Hindi talaga siya leading to a certification agad or an associate degree, pero micro-credential. What governs that space? Um, in our conversations, my Ateneo Continuing Education, very successful kasi ang daming nagtitake, pero anong framework natin? How do we see that? Whose mandate is that? Kasi currently, wala pong, wala pong policy cover yung ganyang areas of continuing education. It is something that is very fertile and very um, seen in all of, in many education systems, but for our country, kailangan pa po nating pag-isipan. So yung mga 5.5, 6.5, and then my CPDs. Ano yung relationship ng mga ito? Um, yung PQF po, mahalaga siya and malinaw yung importance ng framework. Pero I guess ang gusto din po namin maintindihan is ano yung demand mula sa learners and ano yung beneficyo nito sa mga learners. Kaya actually yung tanong po namin kanina in terms of the areas that were prioritized for the Philippine Credit Transfer System, how were these priorities identified? And how are they routinely targeted? What data do we use? Kasi ang tanong po namin, yes, theoretically maganda kung may bridge between an elementary dropout and college na diretso na hindi kailangan magtapos siya ng senior high school ng high school at may ibang paraan may ramps pero may demand ba mula sa learners talaga or iniisip lang natin maganda tong mga bridges na to ano ba talaga yung gusto ng learner at para saan at dahil napakalawak ng industries na pwedeng kausapin nasa ang industry yung may maigting na demand para sa mga ganitong tipo ng learners kasi without understanding our learners themselves and the industries that would actually um, appreciate the value of these credentials or qualifications, baka in theory natin iniisip yung PQF. Pero sino yung mga kabinipisyo talaga? I think yun po yung mahalaga at gusto namin mas unawain ng maayos. And hopefully, masama po sa conversations ng PQF and CC. Um, sa TVET, and I'm sure si Senator Joel is very familiar with this, um, changing profile of TVET learners. A lot of our TVET learners are no longer just high school graduates, but are college graduates now taking NCs. And bakit may ganun? At sa ano, sa ano, saan industries ito pinaka nakikita? At bakit kaya? Is it because kulang yung hard skills ng college degree? Or is it because ito yung opportunity nila to reskill or upskill? we still don't have answers to these questions. And we need to ask that and know where it is really moving in terms of the demand coming from college graduates now going into TVET. Ito po baka medyo ano pa, pero sa PQF kasi, pag nakita natin, yung TVET, you could only get up to level 5. To progress to level 6 and 7, kailangan mong lumipat ng higher education. Hindi ganito ang sistema sa lahat ng ibang education systems. And in other countries, there are ways to progress in Tibet and get to level 6, level 7 through advanced diplomas. Ano yung considerations nito? May demand kaya dito? Or again, theoretical. Nice because other systems have it. But is there demand in our country for it? Is there a need for it? Kasi a lot of the TVET best practices na nakikita namin ngayon, na napakaganda ng mga NC3, NC4 programs, what they're gunning for is to create college programs now. Kasi daw, yun din naman patungo. So sabi namin, sayang, kasi ang galing-galing din ninyo, enterprise-based kayo, higher levels of NC meron kayo, pero gusto nyo ngayon mag-package college degree. Baguhin nila yung sarili nila from a TVI to a college. Kasi yun daw yung 
patungo pa rin yung mga learners kasi that's the only way to get a diploma. But is it really? Maybe not. So, kung may demand ba at paano siguro to diversify the pathways to level 6, level 7 qualifications. Um, also, sa 7796, the test, the charter, malinaw na middle-level manpower development and high school graduate. Pero we also know na ang dami ding learners na hindi high school graduate na nangangailangan ng training. Parang from our conversations on the ground, test na naman caters to them. Pero parang may limitations in terms of scholarships that they could avail of. Na medyo ironic kasi sila yung mas nangangailangan learner, wala masyadong opportunities for skilling, pero sila yung hindi kayang makapag-access ng scholarships. So how to think of that and how to accommodate these type of learners who would actually benefit from skilling? Sila yung sa etayap naman po, um, in my experience when I was still in CHED, the big question there usually was most of the deputized HEIs are autonomous deregulated institutions kasi good quality. Um, in the new policy, we see now that the qualification is HEI is a center of excellence or center of development in the program or discipline, as well as level two um, in the undergraduate discipline being offered. Pero usually, we also know that the characteristic of these institutions are sometimes that they are the more mature but also the more expensive institution. So how do we make sure that there is accessibility to these type of programs? I guess yung question is, may scholarships ba? Or sa RA 109.31, meron bang provision to accept ITIAP learners and for them to get support to access these type of institutions? Or maybe a matrix of the costs that it would entail to access ITIAP? Um, yung sa ALSER, Ang question lang po sana namin is, yung universe ng ALS, we understand that yung out-of-school children and youth is mga 9.8 million, and that benchmark regionally, the target should be about 30%. Um, how do we get there slowly? But also, paano yung mga adult dropouts? Wala po kasi kaming quantified ano, of ilan sila, at ilan sa kanila yung gustong bumalik sa education system. Para hindi tayo nangangapa na we will build all of these bridges and ladders, is there demand towards what? Para ma-focus yun, and the programs of government could conform itself accordingly. Kasi may RA 10931, at napakaraming scholarship programs naman. Um, I guess just in principle, what the EDCOM is looking into in terms of PQF and lifelong learning is to ensure that there's accessibility, that it is responsive to the needs of the learners, um, that there are quality programs, and that it is also sustainable. For example, in the ALS law, it states SEF as a source of funding. We also know that SEF, kulang pa tayo sa monitoring mechanisms at sa dami ng pinagagastos ng SEF, pagating sa classrooms, pagating sa teachers, pagating sa training, sa iba-ibang gastos under SEF, yung ALS sigurado medyo nasa baba ng priority list nila. So, paano kaya mapupondohan talaga siya? And then, finally, just the connectedness of the agencies in terms of the initiatives to make sure na yung learner na iisa naman talagang nasasalo at iisa yung naririnig mula sa kanyang education sector. Salamat po. Thank you very much. Very uh, comprehensive, very uh, enlightening, and inspirational. I think uh, our executive director director pose a lot of uh, questions that uh, we might be able to answer now and uh, perhaps some of you can uh, make a comment um, out of it uh, some need to be uh, studied marami pa ring pwedeng uh, kailangan gawin um out of the presentations here hindi naman ako biased dahil ako si Tess daman but uh, i'm looking at yung sa test the presentation there is a uh, uh, a diagram here, yung benefits ng PQF. Ang, uh, it, it reminds all of us, especially uh, this representation when I was defending this uh, particular measure, especially on the floor. And during that time, hindi madali mag-defend pag nandun yung mga uh, drillon, recto, etc. No? Uh, but it reminds me again and all of us, na, which I wanted to share, that, that that we need this to ensure quality binanggit kanina ni uh, executive director yung promoting mobility from one pathway to another yung establishment of standards ano ba talaga yung standards yung access providing access 
forms unity, connectivity. So ito yung mga benefits of uh, PQF na we wanted to uh, emphasize with regard to uh, lifelong learning. Before I go back doon sa ALS kanina na interrupt ko yung sa presentation ng ALS ng DEPED, we just like to uh, ask ang Department of Labor and Employment if they can... Uh, comment or uh, say something about uh, about about this particular uh, uh, subject matter ma'am miss grace valdoza you recognized thank you mr chair um first and foremost uh, we thank you for this invitation our dolly senior officials extend their sincere apologies as they are now at the um senate uh, committee hearing for uh the budget uh deliberations for it uh, this year, uh, for the next year. So, um, as an update on Dole's role, uh, Dole has actively participated and supported various activities of the PQFNCC as lead of the Government Industry Education Sector Working Group. Uh, we have closely coordinated with SHED on the proposed GIE Action Plan, as earlier mentioned by Director Cherry especially on the sharing of resources. Uh, the GIE Action Plan highlights various programs and initiatives to operationalize the working group's goals and objectives. And as a way forward, SHED will be providing uh, funding support for the GIE Summit as our uh, benchmark activity aimed at convening stakeholders from the government, the academe, and training institutions private organizations, and other key stakeholders. The summit aims to mainstream the PQF, strengthen collaboration and camaraderie among uh, key stakeholders, and also expand the reach among these sectors. And it is tentatively scheduled in September uh, 2023. Other activities in the action plan include research undertakings, advocacy campaigns, and further consultative sessions. On the proposed Senate, bill, Senate bills, Mr. Chair, uh, the DOLE would like to emphasize that these are aligned with the key priorities and strategies indicated in the Philippine Labor and Employment Plan 2023-2028, particularly on maximizing productive, remunerative, freely chosen, and sustainable work and employment opportunities through increasing employability. And one of the specific strategies is the development and promotion of a national lifelong learning policy. So the LEP has been approved by the president and will be launched in a national tripartite conference come employment summit this September. Also, uh, this is aligned with Dollars Trusts, particularly seeking promoting universal literacy at all levels of society, revitalizing inclusive and quality learning in the educational system, advocating learning in families, communities, and workplaces, and then extending the use of modern learning technologies, fostering a culture of learning throughout an individual's life course. And the bills undoubtedly support the goal of the state as well towards uh, transformative lifelong learning opportunities. So more so, the bills will help facilitate expanded access to employment opportunities under a shared labor market governance. And with the present vulnerabilities and uncertainties of the future, lifelong learning programs need to be informed of emerging trends, flexible yet connected, certifiable to standards, and are industry-led. So further, Mr. Chair, uh, we would like to add that we commend the inclusion of the LLDF's objective of facilitating learning for and in the workplace with the participation of industry and relevant stakeholders. The activities identified uh, to measure the success of this objective are also aligned with the DEP and DOLIS priority, sorry, and the PLEP or the LEP. And the LLDF Act shall serve as a mechanism also to ensure that our workforce is equipped with the right skills up to the evolving world of work and in the demand of the industries. The work, a workforce endowed with flexible and relevant skills has many benefits, as we all know, particularly in the evolving economies like the care economy, digital economy, the green economy, and solidarity economies. And it enables all our citizens in whatever sit, uh, circumstances to adapt to social and technological advancements. Uh, next, Mr. Chair, um, the lifelong learning and skills ecosystem, as we know, is hinged on operationalizing the PQF. 
and the PDP's employability chapter emphasizing on the government's role of strengthening the PQF and CC and its governance structure, enabling bud budgetary support mechanisms for institutionalized activities, implementing pilot projects, developing and monitoring evaluation mechanisms, and making necessary revisions to the law. And the department advocates and strengthens lifelong learning through our uh, different specific measures through our youth employability programs, public employment services, particularly our career development support program, skills development through micro-credentialing, and recognition of prior learning and continuous professional development as earlier shared by our uh, colleagues here as well. Also, it is in the view of the department that lifelong learning plays a pivotal role in empowering individuals to proactively share their career trajectories. And this is uh, the department's advocacy through a policy guidelines to, in to also institutionalize the career development support program, formerly known as the Career Guidance Advocacy Program. And this is being drafted at the moment. The program shall equip job seekers with workers and workers with the necessary skills to thrive in the dynamic job market and evolving industries. And by fostering a culture of continuous learning, the CDSP, as we now call it, shall ensure individuals remain competitive and resilient amid socioeconomic shifts, technical, technological advancements, enabling them to keep up and stay ahead in their careers. And the department aims to create more efficient and viable programs and initiatives that will address skills gaps that continue to persist in industries, integrating skills training on core skills, as earlier emphasized, that are highly valued and promote lifelong learning opportunities in the workplace. And among these youth employability programs, as mentioned earlier, are, of course, Job Start Philippines, Special Program for Employment of Students, and the Government Internship Program. These have incorporated lifelong learning through various strategies at enhancing employability and continuous development of our young individuals. And similarly, we incorporate lifelong learning into youth employability programs, including as well our life skills training, which we have piloted from JobStart. And the quality TVET apprenticeships and work-based learning in collaboration with private and public sector and seamless uh, support to seamless transition to labor market. Um, also, Mr. Chair, uh, the bill would help us also facilitate the expanded access to employment opportunities under the shared labor market governance, as this would strengthen the political will, as indicated, and commitment of the LGUs to also improve governance and participation of all their stakeholders. Particularly on Section 4 of Senate Bill 364, uh, the LLDF can form part of the PQF uh, working groups, particularly on lifelong learning, government industry education sector, as well as the pathways and equivalencies, because it is aimed at reshaping the educational system, skills and training competencies, the mobility and readiness of our workers, and also the landscape of the labor market in general, considering the different demographic shifts, as well as the fourth and the fifth industrial revolution. And lastly, uh, we recommend also the inclusion of the department as a member of the said body, particularly on Section 6 of uh, Senate Bill 2072, because of the department's, department's membership in the council would help ensure that the Philippine workforce is properly represented and that their interests and welfare are protected and advanced. So the department affirms our commitment in creating a human-centered ecosystem to guide workers, both the new entrants and those already in the workplace, and in navigating a post-pandemic workplace as the labor market starts to shift and adapt to new business models, digital technologies, and agile ways of working. So finally, we recommend that both bills on the Lifelong learning development be consolidated, Mr. Chair, having the same purpose and goal of promoting transformative learning, lifelong learning. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Just a quick question. No? Uh, first, before, before I do that, let me put on record. Let, let's have a free flow uh, discussion. Uh, let's 
freely discuss itong uh, mga programs and uh, kanina I, I'd love to echo again what uh, Executive Director uh, Carol made mention and the, the questions he is posing, the challenges that we are facing. Example sa Dole, may, may I ask yung kung meron po ba tayo na pag-aaral sa Dole na kapag lifelong learning or uh, nag engage siya sa continuing uh, professional development yung isang worker, mas tumataas po ba yung kita niya? Is there a corresponding uh, increase in income if workers are actually engaged in lifelong uh, learning or upskilling? Uh, lagi natin naririnig, yes, but uh, do we have that study na conducted by Dole? Thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Chair. I think that has been raised before also. Uh, we would Part of the action plan of the working group of government industry education is to revive the discussion on wage setting considerations. Uh, this proposed to recommend or include learning outcomes and competencies achieved in education and training through the PQF. So... There are other similar benefits uh, or compensation that may be examined versus the qualifications that uh, they achieve, uh, that was achieved by a learner and a worker. But um, this was tentatively put on hold uh, primarily because of a lack of expertise and resources, Mr. Chair. But uh, this remains as part of our action plan and we are still actively advocating for uh, this research undertaking. Pwede ba kitang kontsabahin while we are deliberating the budget of DOLE para masiguro natin na we are on the right track? And then perhaps I would also ask the same question I, I raised a while ago, yung of those obtained gainful employment, nagmamatch ba yung qualification and skills nila as required by the industry? Because uh, that's what we have been pounding on. No? Uh, even in EDCOM, we talk about it. Paliwala yung mga pinag-aaralan ng isang estudyante sa klase man o sa informal uh, setting, kung hindi na ito magagamit ng industriya, hindi rin mapapakinabangan. Apo, uh, Mr. Chair, we had an initial study in 2019 that was pre-pandemic on the senior high school employability. But, um, well, given the pandemic, there's a change in the landscape already and perspective as well of the graduates and the employers. We are continuing with the phase two of that study this year. Uh, and then another lined up study is with the Commission on Higher Education for the college graduates' employability. Naman po. So we'll... We are actually doing it by phases at the moment, but um, we recognize the need, sir, for uh, the assessment of misma of um, matching and um, based on the qualifications as well of the graduates. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to uh, point out something. Dito sa, sa CHED and the test da siguro, um, I, I saw this data from uh, CHED. Fa uh, about the enrollees and graduates of our Ladderized Education Program. Uh, can, you, can we show the slide, please? The past, the past uh, five years, tignan lang natin ito, no? Uh, 2016 to 2017, ang enrollees is 43,024, ang graduates 13,249, 30.79%. So, akala mo masama na yan. You go further, ngayon, itong latest data, 11,000 na lang ang enrollees, 968 na lang ang graduate, 8.10% na lang yung uh, data. No? Uh, of course, anyone who is so passionate in uh, reforming our education system, considering tayo, isa din po tayo sa naglalakad at nagpupush nitong Ladderized Education Program. Alam natin na uh, yung 2020 nagkaroon ng pandemia. But even before the pandemic, hindi naman po ganun kaganda yung numero. No? Mas siguro acceptable yung 2018-19. But uh, pababa po ng pababa. So, Perhaps if I could ask whether Desda or Chet, anyone here, uh, if you have 
the reasons for the decreasing trend in ladderized uh, education graduates and what are we uh, what are being done to address this and encourage the uh, program completion? Of course, alam natin yung pandemic, but uh, baka may iba pang reasons and uh, how else we can help to encourage uh, itong uh, program completion. Uh, Ma'am, thank you. Good afternoon again, Sir Chair. Uh, I think we would like to acknowledge as well the decreasing data. Well, we said that there was a pandemic, but please allow us to update the data with the regional offices because they do implement. I think we need to do a refresher, but we are doing that now. We have started collecting data so we can update you. And probably with the Philippine Credit Transfer System, because Ladderize Education Program is actually one of the modes under articulation that we would like to strengthen. Thank you, Sir Chair. Sige po. Sir, please, Dr. Recueto. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to give an example like uh, School of Health Sciences in Palo Leite, which is under the UP Manila. They have a uh, ladderous education there, uh, beginning from uh, midwife to nurse to doctor of medicine. So my question there is, for example, if a midwife ends and exits from the first stage of the ladderized education, how is she classified? Does it need, does it mean that uh, the 11% uh, the 11,951 enrollees, if I apply it to the example of uh, that college of medicine, does it mean that she is already a dropout? How do we come up with those statistics? Because at any point in time in the ladderized education, you can actually exit, and it's unpredictable when you will be going back to earn the higher level qualification. And in that, I'm just uh, speaking of three. So I, d I don't know how to interpret this the data. data. Uh, Chad, actually, uh, this was given to us by, by, by Chad. Yes, I think I would agree because uh, what we get are the completers of a four-year degree course. And along the way of every exit of the 40-year curriculum, for example, Sir Chair, I think we need to get uh, data for the exit credentials. Perhaps the data on yung mga bumabalik din. Apo, yes, sir. They changed their mind. They wanted to continue. Perhaps something happened, family problems, family issues, things like that. But, um, you want you want to say something? Please, please, yes, please. Just two points, please, Mr. Please, Chair, please. on your earlier comment about the value of a high of an education. No, I think for higher education, I did research on this. For higher education, it's clear that the benefits of a college degree is still very high in the Philippines. In fact, we have one of the highest in 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 Asia, um, as as high as China and Vietnam, and among the highest in the world. Pero pababa na po siya ng pababa. In the last decade, bumagsak na po yung value of a college diploma versus someone who has no qualification at all by 68 percentage points. Especially for women, especially in the service sector. So kung babae ka, nagtapos ka ng college degree sa service sector ka magtatrabaho, yung makukuha mo ngayon out of a college degree, pababa na ng pababa. That is problematic because at a certain point, it will disincentivize learners from pursuing higher education. Um, on the other hand, it also points us to the fact that the, re that the returns to agriculture and manufacturing sectors are stable. Meaning to say, doon may opportunities pa, pero most likely, likely yung kababaihan hindi makakapunta doon either because of cultural prejudice or employer preference. Because sometimes employers will say, preferred, preferably male, preferably female, mga ganyan. And usually, sa services sector, nakalagay preferably female, nakalagay sa manufacturing, preferably male. So it really, hindi siya glass ceiling, pero glass wall from transferring to the other sector where returns might actually high, be higher for a college graduate. So kailangan po siyang tingnan. But the other side, and this is our insight from the TVET uh, consultations in Luzon and Visayas, kailangan talaga nating unawain po yung differences ng returns to education for each level. Kasi NC1, NC2, NC3, NC4, NC5, ngayon, on, the, the only data we have is average returns to TVET. And the data shows that it is higher than high school but lower than college. Pero in a lot of our, which makes sense, no? Kasi 
dapat secondary ka tapos magtitivet ka. Pero hindi ka college, so talagang nasa gitna ka. Pero sa totoo, in a lot of our consultations, yung mga NC2, NC3 graduates, yung kinikita nila, halos katumba sa kinikita, kinikita ng college graduate. So it does not give justice or real... It doesn't mirror the reality that in some industries, maybe not all, so kunyari nasa automotive ka, iba naman yun sa hairdressing, manicure, pedicure, dressmaking in terms of returns, pero kailangan natin ng mas disaggregated data of returns to different types of NCs kasi malinaw sa discussions na yung iba doon halos katumbas ng college degree at lower cost. to the state. Kasi ang bilis, mas mabilis yung NCs. Kulang po pa ng datos, but we've talked to TESDA and we are going to partner to work on this data. Hopefully, magawa po namin yung research. Kasi malinaw na yung opportunities of TVET, the labor market outcomes of TVET, sometimes superior to a college diploma, but in specific areas. Pero anong areas na yun, kailangan pa pong siya sa atin. So, pag-aaralan po namin. Thank you. If perhaps uh, TESDA can uh, make a comment on that, uh... Rosana. But, you know, when I was with them, when I was with Tesla, I remember, uh, you know, all these examples that I used to to, to mention that those guys from uh, Dumaguete, the, uh, ang tawag doon? Uh, slaughter, uh, butchers, butchers. Yeah, they were, they were making more than what the president is actually making. Uh, the... The welders, uh, for instance, the, the master carpenters, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, sought-after uh, worker right now. Uh, but 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 tama yung binabanggit ni uh, na ni ED na kay, kay, kailangan ma ma identify natin itong mga ito. Kay, kay, you wanna please, uh, director, please use the microphone, please. Thank you. Mr. Chair, there was already an attempt on coming up with a study with the Department of Labor and Employment. I think we have already done one in construction. Uh, I call it monetizing the competencies, it's primarily because I was once invited to a parang forum in Malaysia, and the topic was about how do you try to level yung yung ano natin yung Tibet image to the mga four-year courses, ang mga ganyan ng slides na nilagay ko, 15 slides, one of which is even trying to espouse the National Tech Book Day. Yung isang katabi ko po na isang, isang ano, Malaysian, he just have one slide for this presentation and he was give, ang slide niya is about pay scales. Yung pay scale ng Tibet graduate to that compared to a higher education. So sa isang slide na ipakita niya na talagang mas malaki na yung sweldo ng mga Tibet graduates than that of the yung mga graduates of higher education. So if we could really come up with a study on really the different levels sa PQF, parang ang tawag ko is monetizing competencies. Yun sa set G namin, sa employability tracer ng graduates ng TESDA, sinasabi doon na yung national certificate daw po is yung nagagamit yun, na-appreciate yun ng industry pag nandun na sa trabaho yung, yung tao. Kasi yun daw ang ano nila for promotion, for ano yung raising ng mga salaries nila that is according to the study that we usually have every year which is the SETG. so basically po kailangan talaga makita natin eh ko ano talaga to um na when we went to to ano we we also interviewed the graduate of site in Cebu the site in Cebu ang entry po niya Yung graduate sa technician course sa Cebu, ang entry level na sweldo niya is 40,000 a month. So entry level pa lang po yun. Ha? So ibig sabihin, dati kasi ang tingin natin, pag Tibet graduate, minimum wage earner lang. So when we had that particular example, when in-interview ko siya sa site, yung entry level na sweldo niya is 40,000 already. And technician level na yon, which means na either graduate siya ng level 4 or level 5 na, na qualification. I remember, no, yung, 
this is how, how you promote uh, these disciplines. But uh, before I forget, I think yung, yung, yung study would also show, would be better if it, it would show what trade disciplines, what yes, industry, exactly. no? para ma-breakdown. Yun because I remember, I just, I just remember, I was in Dumaguete. The mayor is Sagar Baria, who is now the congressman. No? And we promoted test the programs. We showed on video yung uh, butchery graduates natin. See? Eugene Tero. Eugene Tero. I, I remember that, that, that guy's name. So we showed him. Tapos, kilala siya eh. Nung commu commu community, no? Alam na pumunta ang Australia. Ngayon may bagong bahay, may kotse, et cetera. Wala pang isang taon. Parang nagulat sila. Kano ba sweldo? Eh, 200,000 isang buwan eh. Pag sabi pong ganun... Yung program ng test, you were then the, our regional director, I remember. Pagkasabi kong ganun, wala pa yung isang oras, ubus na yung slot. Explain ko na sa kanya. Sabi nung mayor sa akin na now congressman, Teka, well, susunod, wag mo nang gaganyan. Hanggang ngayon may tao pa sa office ko eh. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing of promoting itong uh, uh, mga programs natin. No? But anyway, just to put that... Yes, uh, Dr. Cara. So just to highlight siguro that one of the reasons why our perspective is like this, yung PSA po kasi sa Labor Force Survey, it collects data for formally employed, waged employees. So if you are not in the formal sector that you are employee at karamihan po ng mga kumikita ng ganito are self-employed kasi tinatawagan sila plumber, tinatawagan sila mag-aayos ng sasakyan. Mataas po yung kita nila pero dahil hindi sila nakakapture ng LFS because walang wage data for these type of workers, hindi natin nakikita. Ang kinocompute at yung nire-returns to education ng maraming studies, yung mga empleyado na mas mababa talaga yung kita. So, kailangan talagang baguhin natin yung paraan din ng pagkalap natin ng datos about wages kasi it really does not acknowledge the, the entire world of Tibet and the value of Tibet. Um, yung second po is yung minimum wage, na minimum wage lang. Actually, my research po shows that at least in 2019, uh, the college graduate would get a minimum wage three to five years after graduation. So actually, ang minimum wage is a big thing because you need a college degree to get minimum wage. Most college graduates, three to five years after graduation, earn minimum wage. So if you're if you took an NC for several weeks and you already get minimum wage, para kang nag four years. Kaya sa test na my choice ka, I'm mean, just no, no, no longer with test. No, but 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 seriously, no, this is important. And perhaps we we we'd like to put on on uh, on the discussion table yung uh, yung yung um, approach in reviewing and uh, updating our levels no yung PQF uh, levels perhaps i i'd i'd ask uh, USA the last edcom your, your your thoughts about this yung design ng ating PQF uh, level uh for example should we uh should we look at the implementation of existing programs that allow movement from one pathway or equivalency to another or should the PQF set the direction? What What are your thoughts about this? Wedding, uh, you wanna? Sige, I'll respond quickly, sir, and I think it just to reiterate my points earlier. Aralin po natin sa anong demand ng mga learners natin, kasi usually baka ano to eh industry-led, or parang industry yung organized sabihin, ito yung pasukin natin, ito yung gawin natin. That's good kasi organized yung industry. Ibig sabihin, mas mabilis siyang magawa. Pero baka napakaraming learners na nasa specific sector na hindi organized yung industry, na hindi naseservisyohan or natutulungan ng PQF kung saan siya talaga pwedeng makapag-ambag. So sana intindihin natin na saan yung karamihan ng learners at saan bridge sila makikinabang talaga. So siguro po doon yung panimula sana. Sige. Thank you. Ma'am, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. I just wanted to say that I'm looking at the PQF now and 12th grade is actually below um, NC1 and um, Level 1. And in our program, we've already transitioned junior high school as graduates to quality employment. And it's a matter of um, rebranding out of school youth to the private sector because they're really open to hiring. And I can see Sir Eric really nodding his head. And you said, Gina, talagang may, may datos tayo um, showing that 
our ALS junior high school graduates are employable and it's because of the life skills or the soft skills training embedded in the curriculum and it's also a matter of letting the private sector know that they are upskilled they are digital natives with natural grit so mas ano sila um hireable yung um yung branding nila so ito pa lang talo na talaga kawawa yung ALS because they're not in the as um as uh, earlier mentioned wala sila sa framework Yes, please, uh, Sir Mr. Gardo. Chair, just to add po, uh, based on our experience also, and I think one thing that we could also consider, um, in the PQF, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way we understand it's for NC1 to NC4. So there is an explicit um, you know, framework regarding upscaling. But what we also learned in Cebu when we joined po the TVET and Lifelong Learning Standing Committee is that there is also value to multi-skilling. Um, there is value. To, so what we saw po in skills said by Ma'am Paulette Liu is that if a particular person is skilled in tile setting and in aircon and in etc., it also lessens the recruitment fee or the recruitment, um, you know, budget for employers. There's also much more uh, merit for these youth to have longer-term jobs. So, hindi lang sila lagi nagahanap ng aircon na ayusin from one company to the next. But if kaya po nila magayus ng aircon while also doing the ceiling, while also setting the tiles. I think there's also, um, you know, more data that we can uh, investigate and also look into what is the value of multi-skilling, what is the value of multi-skilling to employers and to the youth themselves, and what is also the perception of the youth towards multi-skilling. Hindi lang po sa upskilling, Mr. Okay, Chair. Parang ang ano doon issue yung proficiency, sir. Eh? Mm. Mm. Yes, po, Mr. Chair. And also, they sometimes the out of school youth also don't know that they that they can actually multi skill. Yes. Oh, po, yun lang yung accessibility sang den po for multi skilling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sige po. Are there any other comments about this? Na kanina yung 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 dole lang balikan ko lang yung ano. Of course, yung 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 role ng peso alam natin, no? But uh, can can we ask the role of peso in lifelong learning? Lifelong learning, since yung uh, peso po is uh, closely involved with the industry and the uh, students, uh, perhaps they should know the gap between uh, the competencies of the students or job seekers and the need of the uh, industry. I'm sure ito tinitingnan lagi natin ito. Can can we hear from? Uh, from you, ma'am, about this? Apo, Mr. Chair. So, uh, part of the annual uh, labor market forecast of DOLE is the regional consultation, which involves up to the peso level, gathering all our... Is to attend your peso, ano, lagi. And ako <laughs> nagpo-pondo yes, lagi nyo, na? Nakalap diba, lagi ko kaming pinopondahan kasi kulang mo. Spoiled na sa akin yung peso, other than Tesla, pesong spoiled. Apo, so part of that is reaching to the stakeholders, including the industry, and of course, the PESO maintains an, the registry, the National Skills Registry, under the National Skills Registration Program. And that's where we see po the, the it's a repository of all the profiles of job seekers and also the vacancies provided by, available in, by, from the employers. So most recently, we have merged po the database of the PESO Employment Information System, our internal database, with our field job net, the online job portal po, that is public facing. So now we have an integrated database, married na po yung dalawang database, and they mirror both, uh, they mirror the same data fields. So that would help us in better monitoring po that aspect of um, matching. So that serves as one of our um, granular labor market information. And also in the pipeline po is our coordination or convergence with TESDA on how uh, from the PESO they could be referred to uh, appropriate training and then also uh, towards the back end like how uh, a job seeker in the event that um, they are not uh, qualified or not chosen for a specific job, uh, they can find appropriate um, training opportunities uh, through TESDA. And we there are other private uh, partnerships uh, towards that end um, also. And 
Most recently, there's a signing of agreement with IBM so that stores ano naman po um, digital uh, related uh, micro credentials, which we also would soon make available through Field Job Net. So we're really banking on, um, of course, the digital and yung green po yung aming next assignment on how we could uh, integrate that also. Um, but Yun, sir. Basically, at the local level, it's the uh, national registry under the PESO that would help facilitate for the uh, uh, lifelong uh, learning opportunities. Thank you. I, I'd like to pause this uh, question to, to everyone. The FED, Chedes, the PRC, Dole, uh, EDCOM. Um, I'm looking at the definition of UNESCO uh, sa lifelong learning. You know, it says... Lifelong learning as a process that continues throughout life to address an individual's learning needs. In yung UNESCO definition. I wanted to find out your definition. And uh, kanina tinanong ko nga, eh, uh, when does lifelong learning start? Uh, right now, we have at least eight laws. We have at least eight laws citing uh, life. the development of competencies and qualifications of the professional. RA 10968 or the PQF Act, the PQF NCC shall make detailed descriptors for each qualification level following the principles of lifelong learning. RA number 11510, this, this uh, Alternative Learning Systems Act, uh, promote lifelong learning opportunities anchored on the alternative learning system, K-12, basic education curriculum that takes a holistic, integrated, and intersectoral approach and provide pathways across modes of learning. Siguro yung gusto ko lang i-raise yung, uh, for example, sa DepEd o sa CHED o sa TESDA, how do you envision the uh, uh, oper operationalization of a lifelong learning institution. So I, I, I wanted to uh, put that on record. Uh, siguro, who wants to start? DepEd Siguro? Uh, uh, Ma'am? Who wants to? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we would like to recall that in the position that we had submitted, we specifically mentioned that in the definition of the lifelong learning, we had to consider the four definitions as mentioned in the, uh, in the different uh, uh, acts or special laws that you had mentioned, sir. One of which is, uh, for now, one, I would like to underscore yung uh, definition of uh, lifelong learning as contained in the, our PQF law, that lifelong learning refers to all learning activities, whether formal, non-formal, or informal, undertaken throughout life, which results in improving knowledge, know-how, know-how, skills, competencies, and or qualifications for personal, social, and or professional reasons. And so for DepEd, we, uh, uh, we have various uh, programs uh, uh, to address uh, the basic, uh, 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 for DepEd, wh whose mandate is uh, to provide quality basic education to our school age children. All our programs are designed to meet the the learning outcomes as as uh, provided in the PQF law as well as in the AQRF and uh, for the lifelong to address the lifelong learning development of uh, our learners who are not part of the formal educational system we have the alternative learning system po yes and it starts in the basic uh, education pa lang ma'am Yes, tama po. Yes, po yes. Agree ho kayo sa akin doon. Yes, And uh, tama ho kayo, no? kasama yung alternative learning system. At uh, ito yung kailangan ng pagtuunan ng pansin. And that's the reason perhaps why yung foundation ng 8th level PQF natin eh, kasa, eh, nag start doon sa basic education. Who wants to go next? Uh, Tesda? Si Dave at si Elsie, hindi pa natin naririnig. Eh. Ito mga idol ko nung nasa Tesda ako. Eh. Sir, para naman may part Bata pa ako, idol ko na itong dalawang to. Sige, Dave. 
Ay, please uh, turn on your microphone. Buti hindi na- narinig yung old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we believe in TESDA and we advocate that Tibet by itself is a transfor- transformational force that, uh, de- that promotes uh, life-wide, lifelong uh, pathways. So I think uh, continuing upgrading and continuing improvement of our Tibet institutions actually uh, is one contribution in promoting uh, uh, lifelong learning. And in the delivery of Tibet, it must not only focus on the conventional way, but also integrates uh, the recognition of prior learning as contribution in making the educational system seamless. Uh, in DepEd, they have the, the, the ALS. In CHED, they have the ETIAP. Now we have in TESDA, by virtue of a TESDA circular uh, issued in 2021, the recognition of prior learning, uh, pri- recognition of prior learning in Tibet. This is separate from the existing uh, RPL in competency assessment and certification. That is the portfolio assessment certification. So now we have the RPL in Tibet to complete, again, uh, the recognition of formal and non-formal learning uh, in the educational system. It's good to note yung how, how TESD envisions uh, the operationalization of a lifelong uh, uh, learning institution. I think... Uh, Swak yung sinabi kanina ni uh, Dr. Carol dun sa uh, discussion natin dun sa EDCO, may remember. Parang meron kang, meron kang baitang-baitang. Tapos pagdating dun sa dulo, isang mahabang plato and then, where do I go? Where do I go? ba? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in addition also, we are as part of our delivery in Tibet, we have already the micro-credential, uh, micro-credentialing which is actually swak ito doon sa enterprise-based training of Tibet, not only in enterprise-based training, but also in the institution-based training. Siguro sa gip na niya rin yung competency-based training. Okay, so because these are actually the training modes in Tibet, so in all these, uh, these modes, actually, the micro-credentialing program uh, ay swak dyan. Thank you. Sige, thank you. Uh, Chad, ma'am, please. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Joel Villanueva, and to the colleagues from the government. So I'm representing Chad as a technical panel, and we just created our uh, working group very recently lang po, Senator. And, uh, well, the definition that you have read is actually a definition of uh, UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning where I'm also serving as a board member representing the Asia-Pacific region. So as we envisioned at CHED, uh, we've been discussing about lifelong learning, which is currently changing. The context is changing all over the world. And that we see it as, you know, uh, integration of not just learning, but also living and why we need to upskill, upgrade, relearn, unlearn some of everything that we have in our minds and so that we can be getting the the new kind of engagement or uh, work and damning initiatives. Some people all over the world, they just use the micro-credentials, no? Nandito na lang po sa cell phone, digital credentials. They don't even need the, sorry for Chad, <laughs> diploma. Sometimes uh, kids are waiting for a long time. But in Europe, for example, they just, uh, cell phones. These are my credentials I got from LinkedIn. I got from, you know, uh, all the, nasa QR code lahat. And so that's why at Chad, we are re-envisioning, re-imagining lifelong learning. Micro-credentials. And we also face, as technical panel po, uh, senator, some of our OFWs or those who graduated and finish their degrees using the micro-credentials and even the mezzanine credentials po. <laughs> mezzanine credentials, they use uh, portions of, of uh, courses. No, This is already accepted in some uh, countries of the world. The mezzanine credentials, few, but they added all of them. And it can give you a master's degree or a PhD degree. So that's why it's very important that we recognize that Lifelong learning is really necessary for the country, for the Philippines to take a look and make it more relevant. 
So yung sinasabi natin from early childhood up to high school, but the portability of the credentials, even wala ka sa formal school setting, uh, you can get all of these credentials already in the internet, web-based education. So ang naisip po kanina is we need to reimagine this, uh, even the framework, no? Ang <laughs> ating lifelong learning. In the context of uh, rapidly evolving economies, no? Uh, at ASEAN, we're now, uh, I'm working as the education advisor of ASEAN. We have two big projects. That's the future of education, the future of work. And ganito uh, we are brainstorming on how the ASEAN economies will be changing, how the workforce is changing, and how education can be more relevant. Baka nga, in the few years to come, by 2050, uh, outdated na lahat, and they just use all of these digital credentials, AI, everything. So we look forward that uh, uh, when we finish our work at uh, the ASEAN Future of Education, Future of Work, we will be able to enhance as well our own portfolio for uh, lifelong learning. Baka mas, mas more of uh, digital ang ating focus or we will take a look also at other ways of getting credentials which can enhance our Philippine qualifications framework. So that's why uh, we were discussing, let's have a framework and maybe in the next meetings of the PQF NCC, <laughs> the tenth meeting, po ba yon? We will be able. To... I'm willing to host anytime <laughs> you want. I'm willing to host here. Yes, fine. So. Kasi so, nabi mag meeting ang PQF NCC. We hopefully can. Si Director be... Irina Bahala. <laughs> yeah. New things in the next meetings of PQF NCC. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And that's 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 how I love Desda so much. And when I was there, I enjoyed so much and had had so much fun. Uh, considering na we always emphasize the importance na we are a competency based uh, uh, organization, competency based uh, um, uh, agency. Last week, I remember was it last week or a few few days ago when we were deliberating on the the uh, bill on ano nga ito, um, um, caregivers act no yung caregivers act and uh, i was explaining to the senators how important it is to 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 realize the value of our assessment um, assess uh, the, the assessment the test that is doing no and i i recall I, I mean, we had this competency assessment program in my first year wherein we 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 allotted a budget of 90 to 100 million to just go around the country and keep on assessing without without actually uh uh looking for this uh, graduates from tech book institutions no yung upskilling yung kumpa nag nag drive ka na ng matagal sa EDSA so sobrang master mo na yan eh uh, kung kung pwede ka nang uh, mabigyan ng uh, NC2 driving etc and uh, most of all yung yung talagang uh, for those who know me uh, very well i've been espousing itong uh, at the end of the day coming up with a supermarket of competencies na dadating ka na lang doon na may dala kang cart i need this i need this and whatever uh, uh, avenue, pa paano makukuha yun? Formal man, uh, online man, etc. Ito yung kailangan ko. And ang importante, merong, merong assessment tool ready to find out kung uh, qualified ka or na na nakakaya mo yung, uh, yung uh, requirement ng industry. And uh, that's also a challenge because in some ways, I remember yung, yung, yung test that we will keep on Pounding on, you must have the right skills, you must have the right competency, you must have the right attitude, etc. But now, uh, there has to be a, 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 a tool wherein you can do it uh, online, na, which is also very challenging because paano yung uh, housekeeping, di ba? May time, may time, ano ka dun, uh, kailangan at a certain point in time nagawa mo na to nalinis mo na tiklop mo to ng maayos di ba so yun naman yung mga uh, challenges doon no uh, but, but let me let me uh, before before i forget na no kasi uh, na, natandaan ko ang ang PRC is uh, uh, in charge doon sa international alignment uh, ang DepEd also uh, looking at uh, yung yung uh, PQF NCC looking at cross referencing with the uh, with the ASEAN qualifications uh, reference framework, I would just like to ask, 
what is now the status of uh, cross-referencing of the PQF with the ASEAN Qualifications uh, Reference Framework? Uh, gusto natin malaman sana if, uh, or, or, or are there disciplines that are um, disciplines that are already aligned with the AQRF and do our Philippine Qualifications Register already reflect the uh, references to the AQRF? Kasi nakita ko po yung uh, Philippine uh, Report Reference against AQF has been accepted as aligned to the uh, AQRF referencing criteria and has been endorsed to the AQRF Committee to the ASEAN Ministers of Economy, Education, and Labor. Under Criterion 11 of the Philippine Report, the involved national agencies mandated to authorize the issuance of qualifications shall implement a system of indicating a clear reference to the appropriate AQRF level on new qualification certificates or diplomas. Meron na po tayo ngayon, uh, currently, eight, eh. eight itong ASEAN Mutual Recognition Agreements, yung mga MRAs natin. Ang kinocover niya, of course, dental practitioners, nursing service, medical practitioners, accountancy services, surveying qualifications, architectural services, engineering services, and tourism professionals, which help a lot of our kababayans. No? So, yun lang yung gusto kong malaman kung ano na yung status ng uh, cross-referencing of uh, the PQF dito sa ASEAN uh, Qualifications Reference uh, Framework. Sir, uh, Dr. Garcia, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, well, it is but true that Philippines has already referenced with the AQRF last 2019. Um, however, yung pong criterion 11, uh, of course, we already have an approved PQF NCC resolution wherein we will start indicating only the PQF levels po for CHET, TESDA, uh, PRC, CAAP, and other qualification agencies. Now, ang discussion po ngayon sa AQRF because actually... Uh, before it was agreed na once you have reference, you can start indicating the AQRF level. However, uh, may reservations po ang other ASEAN member states on indicating the AQRF level because they want to have a common understanding. And quality assurance is a problem po. Even Philippine, sorry po, is being questioned on the QA. Uh, even Philippines po, particularly on the, ayan si Ma'am Irene, uh, si Australia, si, si New Zealand, yung dati po namin consultants, kunay question po, particularly ang baccalaureate degree level natin because they're saying, because a lot of their, the as a member states, the consultants po doon, yung member ng committee, eh mga consultants din po rito ng HEIs, no? So, uh, what they're saying is that not all our baccalaureate degree levels should belong at PQF level 6. And some of them should belong only to PQF level 5. Yun po yun. Si Ma'am Irene. Former Secretary Irene, isa, baka pwedeng bigyan mo pa kami ng mas uh, uh, with, with regard to this. And then the, how do we go from here? Mika and Dr. Cueto have been attending the uh, AQRF meetings and this is really an issue on the table. And the quality assurance is underscored in all these discussions. Uh, but then the Philippine Qualifications Framework National Coordinating Council has to look into the alignment. Uh, there is a case in point that I discussed with Dr. Vea actually very recently. There was this comparability study of logistics qualifications. This is May of this year. Uh, warehousing and forklift operators between Thailand and the Philippines. And uh, the end result, no, not the end result, but the preliminary comparability finding is that level one, level two in the Philippines is equivalent to level one in Thailand or the, or the other way around. Mas superior, superior yung Thailand. Because the descriptors in Thailand, 
the descriptors in Thailand requires decision making at level one. Sa atin ang level one de kahon, walang walang options, nothing. Our level two can only be acted from a list of options, which in Thailand is not a level one. So uh, that to me is an issue on alignment and an issue for review, I think, of level descriptors. Oh, uh, can if I can go uh, on a short note. We were at a discussion of the advanced manufacturing uh, workforce development and uh, the survey of 223 companies on advanced manufacturing, basically pharmaceuticals and uh, semiconductors, require competencies that have never appeared on operator level in Tibet. Because among those listed uh, for operators, Six Sigma, can you imagine us? Uh, Six Sigma for operators. And that's true because we know that even if you're only an operator, you have to understand why Six Sigma requires this and this, and that we have to adhere to all the standards. And so that to me is the end of the book ends, advanced manufacturing. In the same manner that Edie Carroll was there when we were presenting the weavers of Banig, the Banig weavers in Basay, and even the school dropouts. Even the Banig weavers who did not finish elementary, and that's why they are weavers, need to understand chemistry, need to uh, understand time and motion study, etc. Because once they harvest, uh, the tea cogs will go into drying. And before they go into drying, they will have to apply chemicals. And the ladies of Tesla who were at my back said, occupational safety and health, what chemicals are you using? They did not know what chemicals they were using. But then that's the reality of manufacturing. And so that's where we are, I think, in the review of uh, level descriptors. Thank you, sir. Thank you. More challenging, Edie Carroll. Uh, Wow, I I I, re I remember growing growing up in uh, Bukawe, Bulacan, the pyrotechnic capital of the Philippines. May mga tahita hihu ako dito kasi yung yung likod ng room ko may sumabog, may rum pigi na nakuwad dun sa likod ng ng room ko. Eh, I'm not kidding. I have I have I have stitches here and there. Uh, ganun din yung uh, mga out of school youth. Nagahalo ng mga chemicals, yung fountain, quitis, paputok. Hanggang ngayon, may mga sumasabog pa rin na, na mga pyrotechnic factories no sa, sa, sa Bulacan. I hope uh, may magawa na yung gobyerno dyan to, to really and strictly regulate and at the same time uh, ban yung mga malalakas na paputok. But uh, it's, it's an eye-opener to all of us and you could just imagine the challenges uh, uh, that we are facing in... Uh, not just reforming our education to be to be on top of things, but uh, just to be at par is already a a, a great challenge. But anyway, uh, I know I know uh, I I don't have much time because I I need to uh, to go to the DBCC budget para ilabi yung sinasabi ni uh, Miss Baldosa. Um, are there any other? Yes, uh, Doctor Queto, please, sir. As far as the regulated professions involved in Asian mutual recognition arrangements are concerned, there's an advantage for engineering because they have a global standards in uh, Washington Accord. But there are no global standards for the other professions. So what happens is uh, some have adopted, like for example, medicine have adopted British system 
where the entry requirement is uh, from senior high, but the Philippines has entry requirement of a bachelor's degree. And the degrees conferred are bachelors of uh, medicine and surgery for the nine other countries, while in the Philippines is MD. But research has shown that uh, they have the lear same learning outcomes and they have the same accreditation uh, requirements. So sometimes it's not about the subjects, it's not about the number of years or it's not about uh, some methods because some have integrated approach while some have traditional approaches. And I think that also applies to the Philippine education system as far as medicine is concerned because all medical schools are allowed to have their own curricular approaches as long as they attain the same program outcomes or learning outcomes. So that's the point. Now, as far as lifelong learning is concerned, uh, I think the problem is uh, prior to the entry to kinder, who is in charge of the learning? Because uh, one definition is from learning from cradle to grave. So, sino ang in charge doon? Nag kinder, elementary, saka secondary sila, under sila ng basic education, so it's the depth ed. And then when they go to tech book, it's under TESDA. And when they go to higher ed, it's under CHED. And if they belong to a regulated profession, they pass the license or examination, it's under PRC. And as I said, they can retire at 60, 65, 70, or 80 because there are uh, professionals who still practice at 80. After that, they are now subject of the lifelong learning uh, of after 60 or after 80. So the problem that I see is when that person or professional, for example, is required documentation, he goes to deep ed schools. He goes to ed schools, higher education institutions, or tech book institutions, or TESDA. So there's no single database that contains records as far as lifelong learning is concerned. And that I think the possibility of uh, the QA not being complied with because for one course, they are governed by just one for higher education, just one PSG or CHED CMO. Why is it that some are questioning the bachelor's degree? Maybe because when we assess or when they undergo assessment, we have a variation of results. Let's say, kung licensure lang ang basis, Mr. Chair, meron mga pumapasa, meron yung mga talagang ang bababa ng score. But they were governed by the same PSG. And they took the four-year course, so same duration. And theoretically, when they are given their diplomas and conferred their academic qualifications, the presumption is they had competency assessment and they satisfied or complied with all the requirements. So that's one of the main reasons why some are questioning your bachelor's degree, but you can also include master's degree. Kasi at one time, marami mga schools na nagko-confer ng napakaraming masters. Mas marami pa kaysa yung mga malalaking schools. May mga politiko nga ako, laging doctor honoris causa. Ang and, and dami ko ng invitation doon. Ang dami ko ng... So those, uh, Mr. Chair, are, are some of the issues that we we, we deal with. And uh, reflecting that in the Philippine Qualifications Framework. And let me give an example for professional teachers. There's an ex executive order which governs their expanded career progression. Teacher 1 to Teacher 7. That's the first. And then Master Teacher 1 to Master Teacher 5 but they can branch out to school principal one to four. So I was asked in that meeting, how do you assign PQF levels? There are teacher, there are seven levels from teacher one to teacher seven. But as I said, it's compliance to the descriptors that determines where you will be assigned. But there's no 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.5. We talk of micro-credentialing, 
This has been present already in medicine for many years. When I finished my residency training, cholecystectomy or removal of the gallbladder used to have uh, that long incision. But I had to learn, relearn, laparoscopic way of doing it. But my PQF level would not still go up just because of the micro-credential that I have earned. And there are obstetricians who went into ultrasound. So same level, but you have uh, additional skills, micro-credentials. So when do we determine uh, how many micro-credentials will you earn before you are elevated to a higher PQF level? So we have our career progression specialization program in the PRC. Yeah, theoretically, but uh, still we don't have uh, yeah the mechanism for that. But hopefully we will come up with uh, mechanisms because uh, it's uh, additional qualifications, RPL. Uh, there's no more licensure exam, but there is uh, competency assessment because QA, again, is still the most imp important and critical. Thank you, Mr. Th Chair. Th thank you, Dr. Gueto. But uh, may nag-text lang sa akin, speaking of... Uh, Teacher education, sir, na, na release na po ba yung ano from PRC, yung recent LET questions and answers dun, uh, sa test statistics to Teacher Education Council? Mr. Chair, uh, the problem is uh, the tech or the Teacher Education Council is supposed to be the one receiving the most recent licensure examination questions that EDCOM request is a different request. It's specific to 2008-2011 and then 2022 and 2020. Yung recent po, itong nakaraan, di ba? Parang... Uh, it's... Uh, because under the new law... March 2023 or May 2020. Yeah, because under the new law, di ba, uh, PRC would be able to... Uh, that's not yet covered. So most probably the September 2023 September. will be given to the Teacher Education Council because it's exclusive... Because that's uh, specified in the law. So the EDCOM has a different uh, mandate, it's a different, uh, but we will be submitting the available okay. licensure you. examination. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Carroll, you yeah. wanted to... Yes, sir. Just to update nga, that we did, following the last commission meeting, we requested for PRC for copies of the questionnaires of the licensure examination for teachers. We've been communicating, and tomorrow we have a meeting, and PRC has committed that they will turn over the materials for study um, of our fellows beginning tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that discussion. I mean, the the questionnaires. Napaka iba iba pala yung terminologies ng, <laughs> ng PRC. So we are learning that. Sir, balikan ko lang yung uling question mo kanina about institutions that will operationalize lifelong learning. I think based on all of our consultations, napaka makupad tayong gumalaw at institutions for us to evolve, for TRs to be responsive, for PSGs to be responsive. Talagang mas slow-moving process siya. Pero I think babalik ako sa learner. Kasi I think at the end of the day, if you have learners who could adapt to changing needs, to changing times, and could continuously learn, mas kaya niya talagang makisabay kaysa sa institutions natin. Which is also why I want to highlight the important work of DepEd. Kasi education is not just a human right, it is an enabling right. Because it allows you to access other rights and for the context of education to access other levels of education and opportunities for learning. And I think mahalaga sa atin to realize and underscore that the importance of foundational skills and also the characteristics of lifelong learners that are curious, that are continuously eager to learn, mahalagang tutukan talaga natin. Which is why in the conversations of EDCOM, kung meron tayong pwedeng tutukan lang na iisang bagay, ang sagot ng lahat, K-3. Pag naayos natin ang learning at K-3, pwede na tayong tumigil at magsara ng libro. And napakahalaga po talaga nun. Kasi without literacies, numeracies, and lifelong learning characteristics, hindi mo kayang buuin ang anumang ladder paakyat. And that is really where the work is critical at this point. So, sana po, magtulong-tulungan tayo because the, the, the capacity to deliver that, it's not just curriculum, it's environment. And also, hindi lang po DepEd yun, CHED, PSGs, teacher education institutions, quality of pre-service, and also PRC in terms of the examinations. Bahagi po lahat din ng agencies na nandito. Eh. So napakahalaga po talaga ng work na yun. Salamat po. Thank you. Uh, as much as I wanted to stay longer, 
they have been texting me and uh, asking me to 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 wind up. I would like to uh, again uh, thank all of you for being here this morning. Nakakita tayo ngayon ng uh, mas liwanag at pag-asa especially sa PQF NCC. Salamat kay uh, VP Secretary Sara uh, Duterte. Uh, umaasa rin po tayo na marinig ulit sa mga susunod na pagpupulong natin, pagdinig ang PQF NCC ukol sa kanilang mga nagawa at ginagawa upang ma-address ang mga findings at recommendation ng 2021 World Bank Review on PQF, lalo na po sa pagpapalakas ng uh, government structure ng PQF NCC at pagkakaroon ng uh, mas malawak na paggamit ng PQF sa ating uh, labor market. Yung uh, request ko lang, baka meron tayong urgent uh, request na kailangan sa budget as we are deliberating the budget ng, uh, ng uh, buong pamahalaan. Nagagalak din po tayo na marinig mula sa TESDA, mula sa CHED, sa PRC, sa DOLE, ang kanilang uh, iba't ibang inisyatibo upang magbigay ng lifelong learning opportunities for our uh, Filipino learners. Yung challenge po siguro ay kung papaano natin uh, uh, matatahi-tahi ang mga initiatives na ito, masynchronize at ma-align sa Philippine Qualifications Framework. We also heard recommendations and inputs of uh, Education Development Center, uh, the implementing uh, partner of USAID Opportunity 2.0 program, particularly on uh, strengthening synergy among uh, agencies and programs for the out-of-school youth, ALS learners, and working youth. We also heard uh, from EDCOM through uh, uh, Dr. Carol, who emphasized the need to uh, review the present system of trifocalization to identify where our learners fall through the crack among the three education agencies. And last but not the least, we have heard from our implementing agencies and private sector resource persons on how uh, they, they, they perceive what lifelong learning uh, looks like. Para sa atin lahat, dapat magsimula ito sa basic education pa lang. So this is a good start. Uh, a good starting point in ensuring that we are on the same page when we come up with an effective and impactful lifelong learning development framework. Despite the challenges that we face, naniniwala po tayo na this hearing is a good start in invigorating the education agencies to implement the PQF, promote lifelong learning, and improve the quality of our education and training system. Muli sa inyo pong lahat, maraming maraming salamat sa inyong pagdalo, maraming salamat sa inyong oras at panahon na inukol ngayong araw na ito. Maraming salamat po and God bless us all. Thank you. This hearing is uh, hereby adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.